Uh, we have Wi-Fi in the house. Uh, Baraza Media Lab 2, you pick that option. Baraza Media Lab 2, there are several. Lab. So pick Lab 2. And then our password is Karibu. Then dollar sign, 23. The 23 or 21. Mm -hmm. So dollar sign. Wacha ni suwapatia password mushikia Wi-Fi yangu. I need to confirm it's the one. 20... Twenty one, yeah. Karibu dollar sign twenty one. Okay. So media uh, uh, go to Baraza Media Lab two, then Karibu dollar sign twenty one. So that's our Wi Fi. Okay. So as we do it, we are celebrating, of course, the African child. And if you look around, you'd see their children. Nasimani Shiule and Akona Utoto na Meka next to you. We have literally children around us. Uh, so because of the children who are present, I would uh, encourage us to also pay attention to their privacy. If you can, kindly do not post the images of our children online. Are we together? Are we together, guys? Thank you. We have our restrooms while uh, as you exit our lifts to the left, gents, and straight ahead as you exit the lift or to your right, uh, our ladies. Uh, so I believe you were given a gift hamper as you entered, right? Did you receive something if you haven't lifted your hand up? Yeah, you have? So inside there, there is a notebook and a pen. I need you to remove those two. Just those two for now. Before I invite the next person for a small activity. You have a pen? And remove them. You have? Do you have a pen and a book? In your hand? Okay. So for this next activity, I'll request you kindly. If you can, again, be upstanding with your pen and your book. Yes, if you can kindly stand, be upstanding. Uh-huh. Fantastic. So, I need you to look at your neighbor, like face each other, face to face. You have a neighbor? Make sure you have a neighbor. Make sure you have one. You need a, we need a neighbor. For this activity, you must have a neighbor. Hii ndiyo nafasi yako kutafuta mutu. Tafuta mutu. For this activity, unless you're looking at each other, you won't be able to do it. So you, you really need someone. And like you face each other, like face to face. Hey. Sawa? Then you see that book, open a page that is blank anywhere. Open anywhere that is blank. Okay? Then put that book on your chest like this, facing away from yourself. Like this. You're facing away from yourself, yes. Okay, I need you to look at your neighbor, so I'll be telling you what to do. Do not dare look at your book. So because you don't have a neighbor, you look at me as I see what you're doing. So, I need you to draw the face of your neighbor. So, we are going to start right now. So, you're going to start with the eyes. Please draw the eyes of your neighbor. Draw the eyes, eye number one, on your book. Yeah, draw the person you're looking at. Draw the person you're looking at. So, draw the eye. We are, what was Kibia Kuchora Migu Nasjasema Migu? We are starting with the eyes. I can see someone looking at what she's drawing. You can't look. You are not supposed to look at what you're drawing. Do not look. Your eyes are focused on your neighbor, okay? So have you drawn the eyes? The eye on the left, the eye on the right, have you drawn it? Yeah, yeah thank you. Guys, hello? Hello? Are we together? So please, there are children around. Now, now, what do you want to do? Aya? You've drawn the eyes? Don't look at that book. So now we are drawing the ears. Draw the ears on the left and on the right. Have you drawn it? Don't look at your book. Now, now what you want to angalia? Mouth. If you don't look, it will become fun and you love it. But if you look at it, the fun is out. Because I need you to surprise yourself. Have you drawn the nose? Aya, please cover. Draw the head now. You need to cover everything in that head. It needs to fit. Draw the circle. Hallelujah. Fantastic. Have you done so? 
You guys are doing brilliant. I can see some brilliant images here. We have artists in the house. Aya, please put the hair now. Yeah, make sure if they are wearing a beautiful wig, how it flows flawlessly. If they have a haircut, make sure you have... Have you captured the haircut and the wig and you know? Tumeandika and the dreadlocks. Do not, do not fear what you have done. You are an artist. Confidently show yourself what you have drawn. Now look at the image. Are you happy with what you have? <laughs> you can tear that page and give it to your neighbor. They can go, <laughs> frame it and put it on their wall. <laughs> this is your chance to ask your neighbor. Nili kukosea mahali. Nime kukosea tulikosana na ujawai niambia. So... Please, you can tear that page and give it to your neighbor and tell your neighbor, artist, autograph it there, write the date I was in, Duck 2023, hashtag, you know, just for the memo as a memo, you know. Huyo niwe, chukua niya, niyako, utenda utaiframe vizuri, weke mahali. I put those papers down and the pen. <laughs> Ah, yeah, fantastic. You may have your seat, ladies and gentlemen. You may have your seat. How many feel like they're in the wrong career? Do we have some artists in the early walk and go and tell these guys, I'm an artist, I need membership in this place, and I have something to show you for it? Very good, very good, very good. And tell you what are we doing here. Ladies and gentlemen, are you ready? Are you ready? Did you draw anything? Did, did, did anyone draw you? Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Good morning once again. Yes, yeah, so my name is Elizabeth Jambi. I'm the founder and CEO of Wakilisha. I just want to reiterate, we are here to celebrate the African child. Tomorrow is the day of the African child. And so this is a pre-dark event. Thank you so much for making the time, for being with us, and for honoring our children as we discuss child justice in the digital environment. Do have a lovely day. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. So at this point, I want to invite our first speaker of, of the day. So ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together for. I'm not seeing your hands getting together. Mm. Mm. Oh, I need to show you how to clap. So put your palm like this. Yeah, I like it. One of the, the children are amazing. They are following. You guys are forgotten. Some of you have been, when was the last time you were a student? I see some here. You know? Yes, so. Palm like this, then you start hitting one finger, then add one more, and another. It's getting louder. And finally, good. So you keep doing that. I want to invite our first speaker, uh, the CEO, National Legal Aid Services, Ms. Flora Didali. Wapi Makofi Tafadali. Uh -uh. The way I showed you, the way I showed you, start. Another one, another one. Another one. Thank you very much, Karibu Sana. Uh, thank you, MC. Uh, you can see we have a very enlightening MC. MC, I'm sure the day is going to be special. National Legal Aid Service. And I'm here today to join you in this special celebration. Our special guest, that's the children. Distinguished guest and all protocol observed. Good morning. From the National Legal Aid Service, it's a great privilege to be here to celebrate this day and allow me to take, uh, to take this opportunity to thank for a special day and we should always take advantage of such a day to play a role that is always our role to protect the National Legal Aid Service. 
The National Legal Aid Service is a state agency where we provide access to justice. I have interacted with quite a number of you, and I'd like to ask how many of you have heard or have not heard of the National Legal Aid Service? How many have not heard of the National Legal Aid Service? Thank you, thank you for letting us know. That means we need to do more awareness on the National Legal Aid Service. So thank you again, Wakilisha, for bringing us here. It was my opportunity to let everyone know that we do have the National Legal Aid Service. At National Legal Aid Service, that's endless, we are guided by the Constitution, particularly Article 53, we also embrace greatly the Children's Act on understanding the Legal Aid Act so that it can guide us in providing services for the children. All our staff members have been taken through this act so that we also can train other people, whether it's the children's department, whether it's the CSOs, we will partner with them in order to render services for the children. We are also alive to other international treaties on rights of the children that we embrace and we join in celebrating any activity that supports children. In conducting our services, we also carry out a lot of training and this we do not do it alone we partner with civil society. You may be aware that legal aid service is not just an, an activity that can be undertaken by government. The act provides that. We also carry out radio talk shows. Then again, this we don't do it alone. We partner with pro bono advocates who will give talks on various topics and children are always at the heart of the, of the activities that we undertake. The judiciary, we are members of the court users committee and we are always happy to take place, to take part in the activities that they always come up with, which are countrywide. This spreads the services that are being provided, not just by government, but also by the non-government organizations. Today, it has come with both, but given the new way of living, information, digital space, and that is what we used, for instance, during the COVID-19 pandemic, many schools went online. You are aware of the government project where they were providing laptops for children, that is the digital space that we talk about, and it is important for education for the children. There's also good exposure in the digital space when used for the children. This, you can see the new innovations that children are coming up with, the new uh, things that they learn from time to time, and always surprising us as parents or adults within the, with the environment they live in with what they have learned through the digital space. Digital space also is an environment for easy learning. You can ask it anything where space. There are mentorship programs which you can download and learn online. All these are activities that are available to a majority of us. And that is why I really support the laptop for children. It gives them an opportunity to... There's also the downside of this digital space. You've heard of the cybercrime. A lot has been said within the media on the cybercrime that is there. There's the bullying, insults, manipulation children being kidnapped because of going to a website which may not have been the right time, or maybe they were not supervised, and they end up being kidnapped. There's misuse of 
information or misleading information and where children, there's the good interaction, but without supervision, these children may interact with the wrong persons. You've heard of what pedophiles do, and this is a countrywide issue which need to be addressed. And all these start mainly on the digital platform. Sometimes may be exposed to an area which they ought not to have been there. It can be dangerous. So without supervision, the digital space can be a danger for our children. Now, when you talk of innovations, children have shown us what they can do. You saw the young girl from, I think, the Netherlands talking about the environment. We also have our own young girl here in Kenya who gave a speech at global level on environment. She has learned a lot. The mother shared about the... One of the things we do as the National Legal Aid Service is also to carry out civic education. Civic education is power. It may, gives a good understanding on what is rightfully yours and the limits that may come with that right. We provide talks to schools and we like to group these students in different categories because of the age differences so that we can provide information appropriate for the age groups that we are addressing. We also provide talks to the churches. The church can give us two sections, the adults and the children, where we can not only talk about in uh, educational institutions, you will see that their curriculum is getting more engaged with the digital space again. This is an area where we cannot avoid. Ladies and gentlemen, as we celebrate today, it would be nice to know that each and every one of us will carry out an event or an activity that will support a child. Playing your role as an individual goes a long way. Let us not wait for someone else to start it so that we can support. It is okay to support. We are here to support Wakilisha, but if you are not here, or when you live here, go out there and do something for a child. Let's not wait for this day. This is a celebration of what you may have done in the past, what you are doing past. Being here is a privilege to not only myself as National Legal Aid Service uh, acting CEO, but also celebrating with each and every one of you. Your presence, the efforts you put, the energies you have is really awesome to supporting the child. Allow me to also once again thank Wakilisha for bringing us together to celebrate this special day in this very, very enterprising activity. Thank you very much. Thank you. We need to appreciate her like I showed you. Sindio, she's done a fantastic presentation there. Good presentation. Hi, your hand, your palm. Let's start. Add one more. And another. And another. And then. Good. Good. You're doing a good, very good job. So thank you for the next presentation. Uh, I would like you to direct your eyes to the screen closest to you because it is pre-recorded. And that is uh, uh, from... Mr. Abdinur Mohammed, CEO, National Council for Children's Services. Our launch of this uh, 
uh, activity takes place in Gariza on the 9th of June. Uh, preparations are already at high gear uh, and uh, we are doing the celebrations uh, uh, at Gariza University. You are welcome. Uh, I know a good number of our team here have already been invited uh, and we say welcome all. We also intend to do our national celebrations in Busia this time uh, who are engaged in the preparations. Uh, now back to uh, the message we had, uh, especially for our, uh, in order to get gains and actually maximum benefits out of uh, technology and the digital space. Uh, but we also wish to uh, request parents to make sure that uh, they are in charge and uh, they supervise, they guide, they direct, and they help their children in the engagements. Uh, otherwise, uh, if all will be left to the children alone, children remain to be children uh, and may still have their own uh, challenges, in, not only in access, but also in what they access. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, we are not at any one time saying that uh, children should uh, stop ch children, uh, pa uh, parents should stop children. Uh, from engagement in the digital space. Uh, but on the opposite, we're encouraging parents to make sure that they encourage their children, but they make sure that they're in charge and they help the children. Otherwise, whether you want or not, uh, technology and uh, digitization is already with us, and the children will find themselves involved by others who may not care about their interests and who may not care well about them. So. The best to engage the children and to start the children and introduce the children too will be the parents themselves. Uh, that aside, this day generally uh, serves as a sensitization. Uh, it serves as a stock taking also on what we are doing for our children uh, and reminiscence what has happened in Soweto in 1976 at the massacre of children. Uh, our sensitization, therefore, is not only centered to issues on the digital space, but we should look the whole picture and generally focus on how best we protect our children from all ends and all sides. And in connection with that, uh, I wish to appeal to our legal uh, teams who are here. I know there is a very big representation. Many children, uh, and we, as we all very well know, Legal representation is one of the most expensive services that you can have. Uh, I once again, your individual levels or in your group or institutional levels. Uh, above all, uh, I wish to say that uh, the protection of our children is a responsibility for all of us uh, and it takes our collective and, and our individual rep representation and action to make sure that our children are protected uh, and uh, their welfare is promoted and enhanced. Uh, as they say, it takes a whole village to bring up a child in our African culture. So it takes all of us to bring up our children. Uh, with those few remarks, thank you very much and thank you all of you. Two. Thank you, thank you. I know he's not here with us, but even in his absentia, we can appreciate. Okay? So prepare your hand. Uh -huh. Add another one. Another one. Another one. Finally. Fantastic. So, uh, since you're talking about the digital space, um, before I invite the next speaker, uh, I have uh, uh, a son who is six. So they were given homework, and uh, <coughs> part of the homework, one of the questions was, uh, what are the injuries that you can get if you misbehave while singing? Uh, or if you don't observe proper etiquette. Now, that word etiquette was actually used. So my son was trying to swallow his tongue, trying to pronounce it at six years. 
So I had to teach him first what etiquette is. And then, uh, so some of the th things that were mentioned were bruises, fracture. Uh, what are some of those injuries for the singers? Do we have singers? I know we have artists. Yeah? Yes, I saw an injury called a fall. Which other? I can see some kids, which other? Fracture. Uh -huh. What else? Damage of the vocal cord. So my son saw the fracture and he was asked, what is fracture? And so that's when the internet became very important. It was so scary. I was seeing him doing... So, internet is good. But at, at least he learned. So, uh, last time, he <laughs> uh, they were given images of things. And one of the things they were shown was a pressure cooker. And so they were supposed to write what the name of those things are. Do you know what my son wrote? Do you want to take a guess? Because you have one in the house. Anyone who is a pressure cooker? You know it, eh? So, and that's why for parents here, please be checking your homework for your child. Eh? So I saw he had written noisemaker. <laughs> oh, yeah. We really had a ball with that. <laughs> of course, you know it makes a lot of noise. <laughs> so, the internet again became important for him, just for me to again illustrate. So internet is not all evil. It can also be good, especially in this time, because some of us, we interacted with internet. At which level? You are afraid of showing your age. At which level? See, you are confident. At what point? You are working. I, I, I like the confidence. Hey, who else? Yeah? Me, I knew in my high school there were labs, but the labs, if you are not doing computer, you couldn't access. Sindio, do I have any witnesses in the house? Very true, right? Then when you are finishing high school is when you are doing MS-DOS, MS-WAD, Excel, and you are looking like you are very sharp. Where are you? I am doing MS-DOS, Excel. I have a certificate. I have done WAD. You remember? And then you are working so majestically. You have done WAD and Excel. Yeah? Packages. I like it. And they were charging us, I don't know, 3,500 per package to learn Excel. Hi! And now these guys have everything, every gadget at their fingertip. Wow, how technology changes. So children celebrate. We were living in Stone Age, Flintstones. So ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, I want to invite uh, uh, the next speaker, uh, Honorable uh, Jackie Kibosia, who uh, of course represents the bench. So with all <laughs> privilege, please put your hands together for the way I showed you as I invite our next speaker, Honorable Jackie Tafadali Makofi. Add another one, and another one, and another one. Thank you, Karib Sana. speech on behalf of Lady Justice Seresia Mateka, the Chairperson uh, National Council for Administration of Justice Standing Committee on Access to Justice for Children. So this is uh, a multi-agency speech. It's not for the judiciary alone. Distinguished guests, our children, those are the guests, ladies and gentlemen. Today marks 32 years since the first commemoration of the Day of the African Child. The events of Soweto 1976, though painful, have served as a constant reminder of how Africa should treat her children. This year's theme opens our eyes to a new frontier, the digital space. A space so unpredictable and dynamic, a space that constantly calls for the attention of our children. Angela Arest, former vice president of Apple, had this to say about this space. I grew up in a physical world and I speak English. The next generation is growing up in a digital world and they speak social. What does this mean for the African child? According to the Internet World Stats, Usage and Population Statistics, internet access and usage has been increasing globally. As of May 2022, 
there were about 590 million users, that is 43% internet penetration in Africa. These figures include children, who represent a third of all internet users in the world, and are increasingly exposed to the virtual environment. This means that the digital era has fundamentally changed the way in which children exercise and realize their rights. It is clear that the effect of the digital environment needs to be considered in the context of rights set forth under the African Charter. The relevant rights include not only rights, children's rights to protection from all forms of violence, but also their rights to, partic to participation and provi provision. Although the internet provides a myriad of opportunities, we must be cognizant of the fact that an increase in internet usage comes with a higher risk. Children are susceptible to exploitation online. Online child sexual exploitation and abuse, OXEA, is on the increase. This includes the use of children in pornographic activities, performances and materials, that is, child sexual abuse material, sexual extortion, online grooming, and exposure of children to adult pornography. Children's right privacy has also been compromised due to a number of practices, such as the sharing of children's personal information by children or adults. It is worth mentioning that in the case to regulate internet use, Kenya has made tremendous gains. The development of the National Plan of Action on OXEA, the establishment of multi-agency collaboration, and recently the inclusion of Internet Offenses in the Children Act 2022. The National Plan of Action outlines priority actions for all key stakeholders in order to establish an effective responsive re response plan. It's also, it also builds on key strengths and seeks to address gaps in Kenya's child protection system in relation to internet safety. Other notable milestones include the establishment of Anti-Human Trafficking and the Child Protection Unit, DCI, which largely deals with child internet offenses. The launch of the Child Protection Management Information System by DCS, and recently Juvenile Justice Management Information System by the Judiciary. Other efforts include safeguarding privacy rights of the child in the virtual courts. Ladies and gentlemen, more needs to be done to ensure our children are internet safe. Digital trends evolve, day, evolve each day, and so must our efforts to protect our children. I wish to thank the organizers of this event for the opportunity and for making this day a success. Looking forward to more deliberations and engagements in the near future. Let me end this with a quote by Nelson Mandela on child protection. He had this to say, Toto ni jukumuletu sisi sote. God bless you all. God bless our children. And happy day of the African child, Asantini San. Um, Judge Matheka couldn't make it. She's uh, the chief guest at the event in uh, Busia, the launch. So she has to travel today to prepare for tomorrow's event. So thank you very much. Thank you. Now let's give her the, our house clap. One more. Another one. Good. That's awesome. So those were beautiful tips there, OK, as we celebrate the African child. Do we have an African child in the house? How many? Wana watu wana ngozi yao. People living in denial. I am white. I am. Ningozi tu, but do you have an African child today? Yeah, confidently. We are all Africans. I'm an African child. I am. Uliza jirani yako mwenye ajaunua mkono. Wewe ni wawapi? Kwani wewe? Wewe ni wawapi? Eh, they are doubting themselves, eh? Eh? Very good, very good, very good. We are proceeding on very well. Good. Since you've been hearing speeches for a while and you have been seated, so as we go to the next activity, please be upstanding. Put everything down. 
put everything down. Everything, everything down. I need you to, you know, stretch your hand to your left and right. Good. So for those ones who know this one, act like you don't know it. Okay? So put your, this is the left finger, right? Put it up. Yeah, the left one. Left. Okay? Then with your right, cover that index finger of your neighbor. Awesome. You know it. Fantastic. What are we celebrating today? The African? African child. So every time you hear a child, try and <laughs> hold that finger of your neighbor. And at the same time, make sure your neighbor does not hold your finger. So try and hold, but make sure they don't hold. So on this side, you're trying to grasp, and on this one, nani, hauta nishika. So every time you hear a child, you do what? For example, child. Nani ameshikwa? Naona sasa. So are we ready? Uh, make sure you are ready. So I'm going to give you a short story about a child, an African child. Okay. <laughs> I can see people are very sharp in this house. You guys are sharp. Ah, yeah. <laughs> we need to give a punishment for someone. They will stand the whole time. They stand the whole time. Ah, yeah, we begin. So... Tom and Mary are going to school. <laughs> On the way, people are acting like they know this story. Kuna watu wameanza kushikana huko. On the way, on the way they, they met their teacher. Ni nini mnajua story yangu na msemi? The teacher had a child. Nani wameshikwa? Hao wasimame. I am going to give you the second chance. Okay. So assuming to me pita up a child, return it. Going to school. <clears throat> they arrived in school. But there were other factors. <laughs> I see you. That needed to be addressed before the teacher. What one are you sorry, young Wapa? People know my story. <laughs> Before the teacher could place down the child. What total are I have your seat, have your seat. Ah, now, this is good. You are lively now. Now, no, no, when you are Mesikwa and Aketi, too confidently, you just sit now, Lishikwa. I love your confidence. Confidently sitting, and you are captured. So we need to move to the next segment, which is a very interesting segment. And uh, we, at this point, we'll have to split a bit. So David, if you're around, hand is up. So children. And I'm, I'm talking about children, literally. I know there are some of us who are children at heart. And some of us, but the trick on our turtle, to attack at our turtle when they too. It's not us, it's the children who are children. So children, please follow that gentleman, David at the back. He's lifting his hand up right now. As the rest of us continue with uh, the next order of business, where we are. So we're going to have some uh, discussions here. Thought-provoking discussions about technology and uh, its effect on the children. So as we do that, I would want to invite our first panel to take their seats up here to take us through this next session. So permit me to invite uh, our panelists uh, for this first session, beginning with uh, our moderator, Ruth Juliet Ashanja. Please appreciate her. She makes her way here. I want to next invite Eve Kilei. Eve, please, if you can. Make your way here. Product manager, cloud security, and founder, she hacks KE. And then we will also have Joachim Kamau. Joachim Kamau, please, if you can make your way here. Program officer, Chadline Kenya. Joachim Karibu Sana. Appreciate him as he makes his way here to Fadali. Appreciate him. We also have Miss Margaret 
Jay here. Please, if you can make your way here, child psychologist, director, Sterling Performance Africa. Please appreciate her as she makes her way here. Thank you. We also have Evelyn Apondi, project lawyer at Kriu. Tafadali Karibu Sana Wakili. Thank you. And uh, we have our panelists ready. So please, our hands together. Appreciate the, the, the way I showed you one. Add another one. And another one. And another one. And finally, thank you. So I now want to hand it over to our moderator to take us through. Um, Um, hello, everyone. A quick announcement. Um, while you get ready to, uh, well, while we get ready for this panel discussion, um, we will be taking questions um, via Menti. Um, if you have a pen and paper, you can write this down. The Menti, well, you, you have to go to www.menti.com and enter the voting code. This is the most important part. 65. Two two six four four nine. So you go to menti.com and enter the voting code six five two two six four four nine. Thank you. All right, um, as we set up a little, good morning, good morning, um, we are happy to be here. My name is Ruth Juliet Nyambura Gashanja. Um, you know, I just realized the dynamics of this, uh, of, of this area here because the media people are hiding all our uh, listeners. Um, but, um, you know, we'll try and have this conversation together. Um, I, as I said, my name is Juliet. I am an advocate. I am a lecturer at Kabarak University. I am the child justice advisor to the Office of the Chief Justice. So this is um, a wonderful conversation that we are about to have. I am joined by our amazing experts, and they're going to be telling us what it is that they do. We have a short time, so please do send the questions to the, uh, to the Menti code that you've been given. I will now invite our guests to just briefly explain to us who they are, what they do, and what is very relevant about today and the commemoration that we are having on this day of the African child. So thank you very much. My name is Joachim Kamau. Uh, I come from Child Line, Kenya, Child Help in Kenya. Uh, ideally, with the collaboration with the DCS, that is uh, the Directorate of Children's Services, we manage the National Helpline. Uh, that is the National Child Helpline 116. And um, we have counselors and uh, professionals who respond to calls 24 hours. A line that is toll free and available for anyone to call, be it a child, be it a caregiver, be it a teacher, or any other social service provider. 
in response or rather in uh, seek, uh, in, or rather to seek child uh, support services, be it counseling, be it medical service aid, or anything of the sort, and then we are there to support. So ideally, we are also doing sensitization to communities, uh, ideally to strengthen structures at the national level, at the county level, to respond and be able to um, give appropriate response to online child sexual exploitation and abuse at the organizational level. So thank you. I am a counselor. I don't know if I should go on. Okay. Um, my name is Margaret Nje here. I'm a clinical psychologist. I am also a child therapist. And I'm a co-founder and the lead uh, psychologist with Sterling Wellness Center and Sterling Performance Africa. And what we do, we are a consultancy firm in a counseling center. We work with children, we work with families, and specifically in the space of children, we also train in child play and art therapy uh, with special focus to those who are working in the child justice system to equip them with skills and knowledge that they can use when they are working with children. We are firm believers in justice for children and having people working in this space, having the requisite skills to make them better child uh, protection officers and people who appreciate uh, working with children. So happy to be here to celebrate the Day of the African Child. Thank you. So one of the founders of She Hacks Kenya, not sure most of us are familiar with it, but basically our goal is to just educate different students and also now children to the world of cyberspace, where they, what, what can they learn around that area. And I was also in Kabarak <laughs> as a student though. <laughs> Thank you. So hi, uh, my name is Evelyn Apondi. I am an advocate uh, who works with the Center for Rights Education and Awareness, uh, better known as CRU. Uh, at CRU, we offer uh, services, uh, especially, uh, more especially on uh, violence against women and girls, and that's the department where I fall under. We have other services um, that are program work like uh, SRHR, uh, among others. Um, what we do for the child, and um, especially the girl child, is to represent them uh, in court uh, when they are uh, survivors, for instance, um, if they've been victims in um, cases of, uh, let's say, defilement and violence in general. Um, we are centered on SGBV matters. Um, it's important that we are here today because we are talking about the child. We are talking about our future and we need to secure them. And the digital space has opened up a plethora of uh, new um, avenues for this child to be harassed sexually and otherwise. And so therefore this is a conversation that uh, needs to be had. It is timely. Um, because we are now moving to the digital space and there's nothing we can do about it. The only thing we can do is protect our children. So I'm happy to be here. Thank you so much and karibuni sana. Uh, we're going to have a wonderful conversation on protecting our children. We're going to be looking at um, you know, the, the digital safety uh, issues. And I want to start our conversation from this place now. Uh, we all understand what we are commemorating when you talk about the Day of the African Child. Um, at the time uh, when the children in South Africa took to the streets to protest, they did not use, uh, they didn't have the digital platforms to do it. But today, if you look at the media, uh, uh, TikTok, uh, what's the other one, uh, Facebook, Instagram, particularly TikTok, we are finding an opportunity where children, uh, or rather you see an opportunity where children really come out to, to voice their issues. And it's, it works both ways. 
So the first question I want to ask our panelists, and honestly, I want to ask just anybody, feel free to answer this question. What, in what way can we make sure, can we leverage on the digital environment for children to be able to have their voices heard, for them to be able to speak out, for them to even protest against what is happening? Is there a space? Is it safe? Is there a way we can make it safer? Um, and, and how do we protect the children from the aftermath? The children in South Africa died physically. The reports that we have about our children is that they get into depression and they're dying slowly. So how do we get our children to participate safely? What are the avenues to protect the aftermath? Maybe Joachim can start. Can okay, uh, maybe I'll begin. When I look into the South African incident, uh, the white man thought it by himself that it was good to take away the Afrikaners, which was the language that was used at that time, and bring in English, an idea that did not sell well, uh, too well with most of the students that uh, were there at that time. So ideally, how I look at it, I feel like uh, the structures that were there, the community, the nation that was there at that time was not sensitized enough to uptake an idea that could come out of a child. And I feel if there's a safe environment for my child, then we need to create that uh, environment, we ourselves, and have uh, the structures that we have, the national structure, the community structure, the social service workforce, ready to be able to uptake uh, any contribution that comes from a child. And I feel like uh, if the systems that were there at that time were strong enough to accommodate the voice of the child, then what, uh, what we saw at that time could not have happened. So I feel like the structures need to be ready to uptake the voices of the child. Um, thank you very much, Joachim. So you talk about that there, there should be a structure that is able to uptake, probably even process, yes, true. And, and have a, a conversation with the adults mm -hmm. pertaining to what the children are protesting about. Yeah. So Eve, um, you know, through Shihak, Kenya and any other platform, is there a way to create that structure? So, Joachim is talking about, you know, physically, but is there a way to create a structure online which is safe for children to participate and have their information taken? Thank you. I can take the part of, I've seen a few of parents who are my friends where they actually buy for their children things like tablets and what they can use. So basically, for this child to be able to access that, the mom and the dad have created an access control level of like, you can only access this device at this point in time. And that creates a safe space where this child cannot go above and beyond what they are supposed to, to access. And if they, they, they mostly, probably they would use for constructive things like drawing and even like watching um, the different videos that children would really like to watch or even do the assignments. And that's the enablement that the online part would help children um, achieve. And basically, creating a safe platform is monitoring the level of what access is that kid having, at what level is, are they doing constructive work, and at what level have they gone rogue? <laughs> the meaning of rogue is if they now start accessing things that they're not supposed to access. So are you, as a parent, able to now monitor that? Are you able to see that? Or do you let your children just go ahead and do whatever they want? No, not really. Not what you want. As l at, and some parents would say, as long as that kid is not of above 18, they're still under my watch. So basically, that's a bigger thing that parents should really take in on and make sure that any, any, in any way that the child is accessing any data or any platform, even YouTube, there's YouTube for kids, Basically, such platforms, you should be able to monitor what is this kid has accessing and is it constructed to them? Does it help them or is any way causing harm to this child? Yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eve. Um, I want to bring it back to Ms. Njeh here. Um, again, you know, going back into that story that we are trying to tell about, you know, so we start off with the children need to protest and they have gone on. Uh, Eve has provided for them with this platform where it's you know, through the tablet or YouTube or whatever. And then there is a backlash. 
for those of us who use Twitter, you see if you post something, I, if there's a platform I'm totally scared of, is Twitter, because as soon as you post something, it comes back to you, and if it's the children, they're using TikTok. So is there a way to shield and to protect the child? Uh, as a parent that Eve is talking about, what is it that I can do from a you know, psychological perspective, or even from, from your work, and even from practical things that we can do as parents? How do we shield our children? How do we protect our children? How do we deal with that aftermath? Um, I think it will start from the point of um, empowerment. The same way we talk to children and tell them about drugs, about we are having this conversation about children, about uh, tech, we need to let the children know that the gadgets that they have, that the, the schools are advocating and are pushing for them to use them because the schools expect that the children are going to use the laptops or they are going to use the parents' smartphone in order for them to access. We need to let them know about good and proper use and we also need to teach them about misuse of that gadget and why uh, it, can be, it can have positive outcome and negative outcome. Because children see us using the gadgets, that's what we are all using at home. You carry your work home and you're seated there with your laptop and with your iPad as you drive. You're still uh, in meetings and engaged. We are constantly connected uh, with, uh, to these gadgets. Then a child will not see that as having negative outcome. Remember, we are talking about children. They are below the age of 25. What are we seeing? They are below the age of 18. What are we seeing? Even in terms of their mental development, they are not fully developed. They don't have the capacity to critically understand and analyze situations. And that's why, and I'm, as I say this, I'm being very careful. We, we don't want to, uh, I don't want people to use this and say that, yeah, we can take advantage of this. That's why. It's very easy to manipulate children and to hook them into internet because they don't have that, that, that part of the brain that is responsible for critical thinking, analysis, you know, high level functioning hasn't matured. And that is also what makes it very easy for them to get addicted. They won't know when they're being groomed, for example. They won't pick it as grooming as an adult uh, will easily pick that. They don't know about the dangers unless and until Juliet, we get to educate them. So my starting point is, do they have the information? Even as the schools are encouraging, as parents are encouraging, as the global, we are moving into the space of, we are talking about digital, are we also educating them about proper use and appropriate use? Because it's not everything that is wrong. What is important is, the boundaries and what is important is for them to understand when does it now stop being appropriate to inappropriate use. And coming back to that scenario of South Africa, why did the children get there? I think that's a conversation as Africans we've never really wanted to face and ask ourselves, what is it that happened that the children had to get to the streets? And that was a South Africa. There are very many other ways. Children in the African spaces, uh, it's only that they are not on the streets, but does that mean they don't have issues to bring them to the streets? No, they are still going through a lot of issues. What do we need to do? Involve children. We are talking about child participation. We cannot speak as authority figures about issues that are affecting children without us getting to hear the children, the issues affecting children and hearing them from the children themselves because they are the, they're in that space, they know exactly what they need, they are the expert in the space and we can only come to respond to the issues. Are we giving them the space? Absolutely. Great, thank you so much. I want to invite Evelyn um, to make a comment. So 
Um, just going back to the children now, uh, uh, we are assuming these are now Kenyan children. They've taken up the platform. They have, um, and, and, and I have these children in my mind. I'm remembering these children who went out and uh, they were complaining about high school. I don't know how many of us got an opportunity to see that. And they said, you know, they were naming and shaming the high schools and what they did. Um, Evelyn, I'm wondering, are there ways they, they are rogue? Uh, you know, they, they have gone, uh, they are protest, protesting, which is not acceptable, as Njehe is saying, in the African community, we do not allow our children to protest against us. Um, is there ways to protect our children from a you know, legal perspective? Yes, um, <coughs> I mean, uh, each and every one of us, including the child, um, has a right to express themselves, has a right to communicate. Um, under the Constitution, and that cannot be taken away. And the fact that these children saw it fit to, you know, um, voice uh, what their concerns are is actually very commendable. Um, what can we do? Because, you know, they, they voice their concerns in, in a platform, um, in, a, in a social media platform. So the question is, us, as the duty bearers, to take care of these children, we have um, to pick it up. You know, um, that's why we have several um, different uh, organizations, like uh, the, the civil society. It is um, proper that they voiced. The question is after they voiced, and we also, <coughs> what did we do, right? So that now we pick up the concerns, um, are these legit concerns? Um, do the police need to be involved? Does the you know, not, and people who are responsible for their education need to be involved. Did they pick it up? <coughs> is, is, is the TSC supposed to be involved? Did they pick it up? And so from that, we need to pick it up and have that conversation from that point, number one. And that uh, Margaret said that they need to be taught on how to end the channels to voice their concerns. Could they have the legal issues so that they are assisted? in those schools. Brilliant, thank you very much. And I, I'm, I'm happy that you pick up the conversation pro in privacy. And I will, mm -hmm. I'll bring it up to, to the panel again. Uh, but now, uh, Honorable Kibosia mentioned them, uh, Flora mentioned them. Uh, we have them on our pamphlets. We are talking about the digital pen internet penetration in, in Africa and in Kenya and access community. Um, and we have all agreed uh, in the digital space. It's in, but the children also spend a lot of them what is the, maybe the rate of um, digital literacy for parents, for children, and what is it that we can do together as a, a lot about the parents? Oh, interesting. I'd, I'd like to categorize that, you know, maybe if I was a parent, for example, it would be a lot different because I'm more, more aware on what is going on. And for our prior parents, maybe around my age, most of them are actually very familiar with what we have right now, but the older generation is where the online literacy, literally that's what's happening, and that is what we're talking about. The older generation, uh, the likes of between 50 upwards to 100 and something, I hope your parents get to that level, but that's where the literacy now is a lot leaner based on our parents. Ask them, like, hey, you can invest maybe your retirement and get an interest of probably even 10 to 12 percent. And with that, you, they, they're not able to see what is out, what's the outcome to it, and they might now end up being swindled of their finances. And that would be the disadvantage of, from a parent's perspective. Let me now take it back to the children's perspective where... Lit Digital, digital literacy is really good for kids at this now age because they can start uh, really getting to know so much. And again, I'd li I like what you said earlier in terms of the child psychology. You know, children are easy to, they're gullible and they're easy to, to, to pull into any, some, something illegal, I would say. Let me, see, let me put it in that term where they're not, they're not so familiar to what is going around. They're just keen to learning new things and they're so curious to learning new things. It might be a bad thing, it might be a good thing. So on the side of the good thing, they'd be able to really learn so much and they can push towards getting good in what they do and they can also use that platform as a completion of assignments and things like that. So that's one, the children who are not able to get access to those that tablets, what happens? or those devices that they need, what happens there on the, on the bad side, rather, I would say this all, if all these 
children are quite digital literate. What happens? They're really good in it, and some would know what is bad, and some would know what is good, right? And now those who might not have so much knowledge about it, the people still play with their psychology. It might lead to social engineering, and it might end up being... Um, uh, there's a story that went around where a child ended up committing suicide based on the online engagement with someone. It's more like online. Chris decided to, to push them to access malicious links, and they ended up safe safer devices where you, you have control in terms of security. Does your device that you give the child has like something like an antivirus? Are the links that they're accessing secure? So those are the two perspectives to look at from a security perspective also. So I think I've tried to cover the cycle in from the old age to the mid age. And Especially for making uh, the, the digital space secure for children more available and you know there is a way that we can create awareness around that. Um, just and I just want to ask you to give us practical tips for children who have uh, people, you know, um, images, if they come across some of this. Um, thank you for that. I, I, can I take that question a little back and uh, start from the point of, um, again, as parents, we need to ask ourselves, uh, and, and I like what Eve is bringing up, uh, what time and how much time do children have access um, to the devices? How much time are, are they accessing the devices on any particular day? And, and the reason we need to ask ourselves that question as parents is also because then too much uh, exposure, too much use of the devices, it's very, very stimulating and that is also what is going to lead to a lot of other issues include uh, for having our children, they, they're going to be struggling with sleep, especially because of the overstimulation of uh, using the devices. So even as we are saying it's okay for them to use them, that's where the regulation comes in. That's where the aspect of the control uh, comes in, that you can only, this is the latest time, working with what time do these children go to sleep, and then you regulate and make sure that you create enough time for them to be off screen so that then they get prepared to go to sleep. Then the other thing I want us to take us back to is what, what happens to the children, especially where we are talking about issues of uh, online abuse. Now, one of the things, Juliet, is that it takes a very long time for a child to even get to know they're being groomed and that leads them now into the abuse. They don't even know that the person they're interacting with virtually is actually not that person. They don't even believe, they don't even know that the images these people are sending, they've actually picked them from the internet and that's not the real person. Until it happens, like it happened in the city once, this girl had just been chatting with this person and was so sure that this was another 19-year-old they were chatting with, only for the person to, when they eventually physically met in a car park in one of the mall in the basement, to realize this is a 30-something plus. And that was the first shock on her before then a lot of other uh, bad things happened. So what are the tips that we need to give parents and to give children who are, especially who have an experience of abuse, that number one, we need to encourage parents to keep close with their children, to talk to them, and to ensure that they're their first call of point. That if a child is going through something, then it should be that that child can come to you so, uh, for, so that our children can come to us. Number two, as a parent, try to be a little bit of, you know, tech savvy to a certain extent. Uh, if you're the age that Eve is talking about, maybe quite a struggle trying to catch up with everything uh, that is ha happening in this space. But at least the basic and the bare minimum is to try and understand what are those apps 
And, you know, just be there, be online also, so that you get an experience of what is happening. I'm sure chances are that when their children discover you on TikTok, then they are going to use pseudo names because they don't want you to follow them and they don't want to, they can be following you, but you actually don't even know that it's your children who are following you. But try as a parent and just be a bit, get a bit of those very basic skills, be on those social media platforms, just to get an idea of what is happening. Then it becomes easy easy for me as a parent to even educate my child because I'm in there and I am seeing. I'm not saying that you <clears throat> continue to post all your children photos and your grandchildren photos and everything, but just be there and try to be present and to have a bit of a understanding. And for the children, I'd like them to know this, that there's a very high probability, and maybe even the people in the digital space would tell us, that the people you're interacting with are not actually the real guys. And that they are just using pseudonyms, and they're using pseudo accounts, and they are not real. One of the things I would tell you, please don't post anything about yourself. Don't post pictures about yourself. This particular girl, um, she had trusted this person so much, she actually gave an address of where they live by the guy asking, drop me a pin. And she did drop the pin from home. And what does that mean? The guy knew exactly where this girl lives. Don't give details about yourself. Don't give details about your parents, because they ask you, by the way, what do your parents do? And they're like, my mother works at Technical University. That's where I work. So then it's very easy for this guy to follow up from the Technical University website and look for the staff who are there, and they can pick my picture, and they will get every information about me. Stop giving personal information. Don't talk about where you go to school. Don't post your photos to someone that you don't know because of the aspect of the image permanency. And you don't know who else has access to this image. And because of leaving the digital footprints. Don't tell them about your friends because once I know that Juliet traced me from there. So any information that leads to them knowing about you, please try and keep that information private unless you know who you're interacting with. And finally, when you realize that the kind of questions they are, it's time to disclose and it's time to talk to someone who is an adult and who is responsible. And if you must, and I'm using the word here, if you must, because you shouldn't go. If you must go and meet this person, please make sure there's someone around there who is watching. Because it's not just about anything, it's also about your physical safety. Um, good. Um, thank you very much, uh, Njehe, for those practical steps that uh, you've given us four or five practical steps that we can take as children and reminding us as parents um, that we have to be uh, digitally savvy if we're going to give our children those, those gadgets. Um, Joachim, the conversation has gotten to where we're talking about children using pseudonyms. Um, uh, so that they they do not know that uh, you know if 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 uh, that you do not know as a parent that you're following them, and a conversation I had with children once when I was training them on uh, digital safety, they said, "But what about our right to privacy?" They said, "We we that's our it's a constitutional right." Um, so I guess the question I have for you is, uh, is there a balance? First of all, can we say, you know, we are going to allow our children to be children? but at the same time protect them, but at the same time allow them to have privacy rights? How do we put the balance there? As a, I want to ask, as, as parents, uh, as friends of children, but also as an, as an organization um, or NGOs, is there ways that we can have um, or have that balance between the right to privacy and child protection? So, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, the right to privacy uh, and the balance that uh, comes with it or, um, begins with a conversation with a child. Ideally, 
uh, if you look into some of the hindrances that uh, the disrupting harm reports give towards uh, why children do not access internet, one of them is the fact that um, uh, children share devices with other people who are adults. Ideally, uh, children felt like uh, that denied them the right to privacy, and so they felt like uh, their right to explore the, the online uh, space is inhibited. Uh, as a parent, I would look at it from this perspective. I have a discussion with my child, and I've clearly edu educated or enlightened my child on what is right and what is wrong within the online platform. Then it is my responsibility as a parent to make sure that this child understands that her right to privacy is ensured. I'm inhibiting the privacy of this child. If this child has an Instagram account, and uh, I give conditions that if you have to use the Instagram account, then I need to look into who you send messages to, and the girls you are talking to, and the boys you are talking to, then you inhibit the privacy to, uh, to uh, the right of privacy to that child in the home. Then I think you get the balance. So I, I feel like um, the balance between the right to privacy and the right to you know, access the online platform without restrictions begin with a conversation right at home. And that's why uh, they should know that I should be a smart child when I go to the internet. And it's the responsibility of a parent or a caregiver to make sure that this child knows. When we talk of smart, like uh, Njehia has explained, ideally you should not share information that is private to you and confidential. You should not p meet people who you've met online, uh, physically. You should not accept gifts. You should not accept um, requests from people that you don't know. You should know that not inf all information in the online platform is reliable. And if you have to meet someone, then you need to disclose to an adult. So it begins there, a discussion with a caregiver be it a parent, be it a guardian, be it a teacher, or anyone in charge of looking after the safety of the child, then you can get that balance in that, uh, in that sense. But, uh, Juliet, just to uh, chip in also, isn't there a balance of safety as well, in the sense that um, when you're talking about something on the social media, I think the question to the child would be, uh, are you comfortable with what you're posting? Mm -hmm. Is it some information that if your father, your mother, your teachers, your aunties, and your uncles had access to it, would you be embarrassed about it or not? And if the answer is I would be embarrassed, that's where now the issue of, okay, let's talk about what is yeah. it that you're posting. Yeah. Brilliant. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Njehia, for, for reiterating that particular point on the balance between the right to protect, the right to... Um, the, the dark side of what the digital platforms can be for children. And from your work, I want to understand what is the and uh, child online um, exploitation, for instance, is there, a, is there a nexus, legally speaking, um, and what are the protections that we have for children from, a di uh, from the legal perspective? Thank you. Yeah, um, there is a link. Um, as uh, the speakers, I believe uh, Jihia and uh, Eve have spoken about uh, grooming. They've, they've, they've mentioned that a lot. Um, that is part of sexual abuse because um, the grooming uh, at the end of the day is supposed to benefit the adult who is doing the grooming uh, sexually. So they have the sexual gratification. Um, there's online harassment of these children. There's uh, general cyberbullying by the children uh, themselves, that is peer-to-peer, -peer, and also just adults bullying children for some reason. Um, the internet is a wild uh, place to be in. And so therefore, um, this child had or needs to be protected. And that's why, um, as Honorable Kibosia was giving the speech, she mentioned that the Children's Act actually uh, protects these children from the cyberbullying, from the online harassment. And so therefore you can approach court uh, through that. Um, but let's not forget there are other avenues like the criminal, criminal uh, justice uh, system avenue. You can go to the police. You can report this. And the beautiful thing is that nowadays you don't even need um, the parent to be the one reporting. The child can be accompanied by anyone, can be the teacher, can be the social worker, anyone that they have um, 
found it fit to, to disclose to to the police station and action can be taken. Of course, there are protocols where the, the parent or guardian needs to be um, uh, told that you know your child is here and this is what they're presenting with, but we have avenues and we encourage parents to actually take these avenues. You know, one of the, of the reasons why um, probably we do not have so many of these uh, uh, cases being prosecuted or maybe a civil route being uh, followed is that uh, there isn't information out there. Parents do not know. We are still struggling with understanding how TikTok works. And so therefore we have no choice but to get on board and understand that so that we can protect our children. And so, um, of course, when you approach the courts, uh, for instance, in the Children Act, the, 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 the Children Court, being a specialized court, has so much power uh, to, as long as it's in the best interest of the child, they have so much power to protect this child. I'll give you a very good uh, brief um, uh, story that I, on a case I handled. This child, uh, who was under the age of five, was being posted by their father. So it's the dad who was posting them on Facebook, and now the, because the parents were not together yet, the other, the other uh, a person who was now getting married to the dad starts saying this is my child and posting them everywhere and just um, one thing led to another and the child was kidnapped at some point thankfully they were found and so you can see how dangerous it is it is not even the child themselves exposing themselves to the social media platform and so therefore we need to be very careful and it is a court that uh, ordered this particular person to stop posting and to pull down all those posts, and the child is now safe. And so we cannot downplay uh, the importance of the children informing the child and informing the parents of what to do and what their rights are. Amazing. Um, I want to, we have, I think, for, uh, the last maybe two minutes uh, to be able to, to wrap up. Um, I, Eve, please. I was just going to ask her a question in terms of how do you now deal with the peer-to-peer? -peer? Let's say each of us were grooming each other and we're just 15 year olds. How do you deal with such from a legal perspective, especially when now parents are involved and they're like, this is not my child and all those things? Parents, <laughs> parents are involved and they're saying that, that is not their child. Uh, parents who are in denial that their children cannot, uh, yeah. It, it, it becomes difficult when it comes to peer-to-peer, -peer, um, you know, when, when that is the case. However, that is why we have um, services like the counseling services, mm -hmm. right? So if we have to involve our schools, because these children are in school somewhere, we can only communicate to them. If it, um, you know, m when we bring out this information to them that this is wrong, you shouldn't be doing this, then, um, I think we, we are on the right path. Several institutions offer this, and that's the best way. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Eve and Evelyn. <laughs> that's uh, wonderful. I think the next panel will actually be addressing access to justice. And one of the things I would like to hear, uh, I hope the next panel actually deals with, is share renting. It's interesting to hear that, a parent, that, that the court ordered that the parents put uh, down the, the photos of their, or remove their photos of their child uh, from the digital platforms. Um, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I want to invite you for one minute to give your parting shot um, on this amazing conversation. We will start with uh, Joachim and uh, head and arm. So uh, when we talk of uh, the right of the child in the online platform, uh, we, are, we are saying that um, the responsibility of protecting children lies with all of us. As a child, you have a responsibility. And remember, with every right that is granted to a child, comes with it a great responsibility. So we have um, a responsibility to the child, a responsibility to parents, a responsibility to civil society organizations and the government to make sure that children are protected at all times. Again, there's one group of uh, children that we would not uh, wish to forget. These are children who are perpetrators of online crimes. Uh, for the longest time, a lot of emphasis has been given to children who uh, survive us. But the child who, who has perpetrated the crime has, over the time, been set aside. 
I feel like uh, there are also services, reintegration services, rehabilitation programs that are there to make sure that this child also is facilitated. So I want to leave it at that and thank you. Right. <clears throat> for me, uh, I, like Joaquin says, the responsibility for protect, protecting children uh, is everyone's responsibility. And I would just like to highlight that uh, we may not think that uh, online exploitation has such adverse effects on children, uh, but children who are going through online abuse, they are more at risk to anxiety, stress, and those are the kind of children today we are seeing presenting with self-harm. They are more likely to be depressed. They are more likely to engage in a substance use as a way of trying to manage what they are dealing with they are more likely to also drop academic. That their children and probable, they didn't even know what they were getting themselves into. And the only way to help them pick up their pieces is to ensure that they have access to quality child therapy services. So let's keep the conversation going. Let's avail it to them. Let's support them so that we can make their future better and we can help them grow. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. And what I would advocate for is, I like the part that everyone here is saying that it's good to have uh, child safety first, and that is really key. And what I would say from my side is, I'd like to engage more children in digital literacy. Why I would say that is, I would have learned so much if I had access when I was younger, and I would be the best hacker maybe in this Kenya right now. <laughs> yeah. And Young, uh, for a few other kids I've been able to train on cyber security, for example, they have really done the best certifications right now and they're just completing their A-levels or Form 4 right now. And they're actually, one of them is employed by KPMG right now and is only 17 years old. So see the impact that these children can get if there's a lot of digital literacy towards the kids and the younger generation to getting access to information and now getting the part of getting to know what to do and how best they can leverage that for the good purpose or the good cause, of course, not anything illegal. Right, so um, what I'd say is that tech is here and it's here to stay. And so it's, it's for us as a, a people, as a society, to learn how to have a, or safeguard our children when they're in the digital space and they're using that. Um, we should remember that there are laws that protect them and do not be shy to seek for advice. Even if you call, the, the, we have so many uh, you know, sure. uh, persons represented here, call them, listen to them, understand what you can do uh, so that you protect your child when they are in these tech spaces. And so uh, because uh, the technology space and online spaces are being used, um, you know, they're misused, they're weaponized. Uh, against these children. That is where we have radicalization. That is where we have, you know, uh, sexual exploitation. So uh, we need to be vigilant um, so that we protect our children. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much. Uh, we have learned quite a lot today, if I could just summarize quickly. Uh, from our panelists, uh, the first thing is that the digital environment is not all bad. There is quite a lot of positive things to learn, and I'm looking forward to having a good conversation with Eve, with Eve uh, from She Hacks, uh, so she, she can tell us how to hack uh, positively. Um, but we've, we've also learned that uh, there is need for structures to be able to respond to the issues that children do bring, uh, especially if they use the, the digital platforms as well as offline platforms. Um, the other thing we've learned is that we need to regulate and control the use of the digital environment for our children. Uh, we've also heard about uh, the need for children to be careful, um, to not share their information, to have an opportunity to disclose. And for that to happen as parents and adults and guardians, we must be available and create a safe space for children. But also Joachim has reminded us that it is an, there is a balance between child protection and child and the, the right to privacy as well, and we must be able to observe that. And finally, um, that there is definite link uh, between online exploitation and, um, and, uh, and sexual abuse, and that we must report, and we can use the, the um, line 116 to yeah. report 
um, cases, the parents can also call for advice and psycho uh, psychological help and support uh, on behalf of their children and for their children. And the children themselves can actually make this phone call themselves. So thank you so much. Thank you, Joachim. Thank you, Njehia. Thank you, Eve. And thank you, Evelyn. And I wish you all a good day. If there are questions, please use um, the, um, what was it called that, you, that you were given? There's a code that you were given. Please use that. Thank you so much. I want to give back the microphone to the MC. Thank you. Wasn't that lovely? Was it or wasn't it? It was. It was, right? Yes. Would you appreciate our panelists for that uh, beautiful time we've had? In our, in our way, in our way. Pam, Anza Kupiga, one, two, three, four. Finally, we appreciate you. And because of you sacrificing to share with us, we have a token of appreciation that we want to give each of you. So I'd invite Joy to come over as we present them with their tokens. Thank you very much, MC. Thank you, our lovely panelists. You are. OK, so I'll start the first person um, when we call out their name, OK? So <laughs> the first person we shall um, appreciate today is um, Madam Ruth Juliet Kashandra, who was our very able moderator. Thank you very much, Ruth. <laughs> Thank you. This is with love from Wakilisha. <laughs> Thank you so much. All right, you guys are good hype men. Thank you. <laughs> the second person we shall appreciate is none other than Miss Margaret Njihia. Thank you very much, Miss Njihia. This is with love from Wakilisha. Thank you. Miss Njihia is very special to us. We'll, we will talk about her shortly. Don't worry. <laughs> yes, and the other person I have the privilege of appreciating this beautiful day is none other than Eve Kilel. Thank you, Eve. Eve is from She Hacks. Thank you, thank you so much. This is something small from Wakilisha Asante Sana. Thank you very much, Miss Evelyn. You, thank you so much. And last but not least, we want to appreciate Joachim Kama, um, Kamau. Thank you very much, Joachim. Thank you very much. Let's just give them a round here. Thank you. Thank you, Joy. You've done a fantastic job. Uh, good. Yeah, we are having very robust conversations here. I'm picking a lot of points here. I've been having a fight with my kids, especially about monitoring what uh, they see and uh, agreeing with them on what time to sleep. You know, screen time. Screen time. Any, any witnesses in the house? Anyone with, with the same struggles or um, just Kenyaji Pro Max on my own? Come on, guys. I have a lot of fight with my kids about screen time. You know, you have to. Because tomorrow it's school. So... But anyway, thank you for the tips. We've, uh, that was quite uh, a good and enlightening session. So, because we've been seated for a while, taking notes for a while, so I want to give you an activity. Uh, this activity, take a clean page on your book. Clean, 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 clean. And you need to, it must be a page that can detach. It must be a page that can detach. You understand that conversation? Yeah, before I invite the next person. So, I need you to write something for someone here that just in one sentence, a line that, a mantra that can encourage someone in this room right now. You don't know what they're going through, but you know, it can be anything. Go, go, girl, you know, like uh, you have it in you. Have you written it down? Just that. Write it down. 
Oh, you want to think about it? Okay, think about it. I'm counting down. Eight, <laughs> nine. Just one thing. And it must be detachable. You detach it from that. So once you've done, I need you to get that page. Now see, like that whole page, remove it from your booklet. Just one thing that, you know. Mm. Okay, you have? Hey, I, I can hear something, something happening on your books. You've removed it? Then detach that page from your booklet or from your, you know, detach it and hold it in your hand. I'm about to preach right now. You're about to receive 300,000 on your phone. <laughs> Those kind of messages. Okay, have you removed it? You're holding it in your hand? That's scared too, yes, and I'm not seeing people holding anything. Holding it, fold it again, fold it. Remember, you fold it into two, fold it again. Make it a little bit smaller than how it is right now. Yeah. Okay. Then hold it up. I love the way you guys are following instructions. My guy, fold it again. Not in two. I want it to, you know. There's a reason why I'm telling you to fold it that way. Because that piece of paper is about to move around. So, okay. You have it up. You have it up? You have it up? You have it up? I need you to lift it. I'm seeing others are not lifting them up. Close your eyes. Close your eyes. You either throw it in front or to the back as far as you can or in front as far as you can, but it needs to land on, land on someone or south or west. Just make sure your piece of paper does not land on your palm. Because some of you are very mischievous. Sawa, are you ready? In three, two... One, throw it. Okay, pick the one that is closest to you. They have nothing at all. Make sure if you're picking, you're not picking your own. Okay? So I just want how many people, like three, to share what they have. And keep it. You never know. Maybe it is speaking to your situation right about now. Who wants to share what they have received? I, I can see a hand there. Can I pass over this mic? Let me pass it. You never know who you are talking to. Huh? Okay, morning, everyone. For me, you are stronger than you think. Keep going. Thank you. That was awesome. Uh -huh. You want to guess who wrote it? <laughs> okay. I'm stretching it. Uh-huh. What you're going through. You needed it, eh? Oh, and the lady said, oh. Yeah, and the man said, yeah, yeah, sour, sour, yeah, sour. Yes, yeah, we have a gentleman at the back. Good morning. Morning. Okay, I'm lucky to get to. Oh, wow. Okay. Maybe Nishida Ming, you can done it, so. <laughs> okay, uh, this one is a uh, hashtag. Listen to the African child. Mm.
So if you got it and you don't think it's yours, close your eyes and perhaps throw it this direction if you can, so that it can come here where there is a lot of needs. There is a lot of needs. Good, 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 good. I like what was being shared uh, here. You guys loved what was being shared uh, about the tech, this tech, this tech generation. Yeah? That was a beautiful one. And I know we have uh, our own stories of technology and this. I hear apparently that there is a, quite a big battle between the millennials and uh, the Gen Z. Is it true? Okay, so the looks you are giving me is like I'm reading from a different. Eh? We know Gen Z. Who feels like they are Gen Z here? I can see. You know, Gen Z, you can see the face and know this one looks like. Yeah. <laughs> you know, Gen, Gen Z, who are the millennials? If you are a millennial like me. Yeah, I see a few hands. So the rest of you, where do you belong? Because clearly you are not Gen Z. In the middle. Uh, in the middle. Look at your confidence. In the middle. Nana Kona Vizuri, you just look like me. This. You know, so we people of the millennials are angry with this Gen Z because they are making it. Eh? And it was a soft life. Yeah? And the rest of us toiling. Gen Z, they wake up, do an app in two weeks, they have cheng cheng. That's why the president is saying these creatives need to pay. What percentage? These Gen Z are ruining our lives, man. You know, they, things are working, they are sharp. You know, but it's because they are also born in a tech savvy world. Like they are always telling you guys, the people who did, you know, to Kimaliza High School, Tulifanya. Come on, guys, I'm not that old, eh? Yeah? Speak confidently. We know. We speak for us. <laughs> we did the packages. Yes. Cindy, am I talking? Yeah? What else are you guys doing? Yeah. ICDL, yeah, uh -huh. and then you went to driving school. These kids are born knowing how to drive. My son, in fact, at six asked me, Dad, me, I want a driving license. I'm asking him, what do you mean? See me, I see the way you drive. You just wash that thing, you press your feet down there, and this car moves. Quite how difficult is that? Six, six. So, each generation, I'm now going to driving school, yeah. BCE, Mimi and Nanda Shalori. When you will end the Shalori, Nanda Shalori, say, Yeah? I know how to change gear. You start with gear two. Yeah? You start with gear two. Uh -huh. Anyone driving lorries right now? Automatic. Look at yourself. Millennials versus? Millennials versus? Yeah, Gen Z. Changam Kabanam, Fike Gen Z. Gen Z, people who are. So this is for you. Technology is here to do what? You better embrace it, otherwise, So I want to pass over now to our second panelist. I, I believe you're set up. We still have one more. Oh, he's here. Yeah, welcome, sir. So let me pass over this uh, mic to our moderator, Brian, if you can kindly take it, take it away. Thank you. Mic check one two okay, it's good. Well, I think we're good to start. Thank you. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, it's very nice to be here, and um, thank you for your patience and for being here today. Um, and it's my humble duty to introduce them. The second panel um, will be talking about children in the in di and digitalized legal systems. Um, my name is Brian Bright. I am the co-director of communications at Wakilisha. And I am joined by this um, wonderful panel who will 
um, help us have this conversation together. And um, I will ask them to introduce themselves, um, starting with um, the first person on my immediate left. Good morning. My name is Valentine Manyasi. I'm a prosecution counsel from the Office of the Director of Public Prosecutions. I prosecute within the Children Division, uh, which is part of the ODPP. Uh, and I, on a daily basis, deal with uh, children in contact and conflict to the law. And it's a, it's a subject I'm passionate about. And we are always looking for ways to improve children's experiences in the judicial system. Thank you. Thank you, Valentine. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Nelson Nkari. I am an advocate and a software engineer, and also the founder, especially dealing a lot with automation and AI systems for use uh, in legal work. Thank you. Thank you, Nelson, and welcome. And the legal, core legal, then um, conflict with the law, contact with the presentation and support for them. Uh, so we get pro bono lawyers who, can, who are able to uh, take up cases with us. Number two, we offer them mentorship. That's what we do at Wakilisha, and I'm very happy to be part of this uh, distinguished panel. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Joy. Okay. Good morning, once again. I specialize in children matters, and especially I have a very keen interest uh, in uh, the digital space for children, because it's an area that has not been explored. Thank you. Um, thank you to all panelists and um, welcome to this conversation. Um, before we start the conversation, I just want to remind everyone that we are collecting questions. Um, on the on Menti, I shared the voting code. You have to go to menti.com and use the code 65226449. I'll say that again. Um, go to menti.com and use the code 65226449. Four, nine. Now, all the questions that have already come to the mentee, um, we haven't ignored them yet. Um, most of them are to be answered, or the answers to those questions will be found in this conversation and in the third panel as well. Um, and also, any questions that you feel were not um, responded to sufficiently, um, we will be launching the second season of our Wakilisha podcast um, very soon. And these are some of the questions that we'll be building, we'll be building conversations out of. So um, thank you for sending them, and I encourage you to continue um, sending your questions. And now um, to my panel, we're talking about children and digitized legal systems. But then I imagine that there could be people in here who are not even sure what we're talking about when we say digitized legal systems. Um, maybe some of us already know that legal systems were digitized at some point, maybe because of COVID and the need to do that. Um, but how exactly were they digitized? What digital systems are we talking about? And I can address this question to Honorable Kibosia. Um, now, COVID, for us came as a blessing in disguise. Um, on 15th of March, 2020, we closed all the physical hearings for, for health reasons, for safety. Now, after, I think, that Monday morning, we gathered as magistrates and asked what about our clients. In as much as we are closing, we will be working from home how will our clients access justice? If, for instance, a child is uh, defiled on Monday morning, where will they go to? That question disturbed us, and for some strange reason, we refused to go home. We decided to have a meeting, as a, by then I was in Makadara Law Courts, and we asked, a very, um, we asked ourselves questions. What about those in, in, in prison, for instance? Do, 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 they, do we need to reach out to them? What, what does Article 50 mean during this uh, pandemic? So we had a meeting, an emergency meeting, and came up with what we called COVID rules, COVID practice directions that were adopted by the NCAJ as official rules that uh, originated from Makadara Law Courts because we refused to close the court. We got into our cars then, we realized, no, we cannot just leave uh, our clients. So we had to go back and had an emergency meeting. The first virtual court was launched on 16th of March in Makadara Law Courts, in a criminal setup. And what we did was to reach out to our clients in custody. 
just to check on them because they, they had panicked. They, 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 they thought the world had come to an end. In fact, this one I spoke to, the first, my court was the first to go virtual. And they asked, are you still alive? And I told them, I thought you were seeing me. They said, no, you could be there, but you, you are dead spiritually. And uh, ours was to assure them that, that we are still there. And we, we, we now ask them to try and as much as possible to communicate with their loved ones through our platforms. So yes, the first digital court was not a court session, but it was a meet and greet. And also to connect the clients in custody with, with, uh, with their loved ones who came to court. The remoteness of the, the virtual court began. And then of course the civil space, the advocates complained and said, no, we cannot just sit at home. Um, and the first was to have a meeting with the then uh, Chief Justice um, after the 16th of March. We came up with draft uh, practice directions and since then we've never gone back. Mm -hmm. In fact, I'm sitting, I was just sitting next to one of the advocates and we are almost proceeding with her here. <laughs> <laughs> then we remembered you're supposed to go virtual. <laughs> so we could not proceed. So we decided we will proceed virtually on Tuesday. So it's, it's easier now because we are able to reach far and wide. I can report that Makadara reached 2,800 within six months. Those are just clients we reached out, both children and uh, adults. And we're able to reach combined, I'll give you the stats for the children, but to just reach out, we reached out to all the CCIs. Mm -hmm. All um, children homes were reached. Within one week, we had done over 120 children, just checking on them. And I'm glad that uh, Maggie is here because we first, we did um, teletherapy. The therapist was online just to talk to the children in that space. Mm -hmm. So yes, that's the, the, the genesis of the virtual space. It started from a very small court in mm -hmm. Makadara. Mm -hmm. And then Milimani, the bug <laughs> caught up in Milimani. And uh, so far we've made a lot of gains but we are still um, waiting for practice directions for children. How do I treat a child in the virtual space? Uh, How do I protect their privacy? Yeah. Im impressive. Um, I mean, my next question would be, I imagine that having to work in that digital space, um, you would need some sort of digital literacy of you know, some sorts. And I know this was even a question that was asked already. I, not, in not being very digital literate, literate to access virtual court or um, e-filing and such systems that are already in place. And I know that um, some of us have worked with these um, children in the past, and maybe I'll give Joy um, an opportunity to respond to this. How does literacy impact children accessing these systems? About this children e-filing platforms, and um, why do I say this? Let me start from explaining the concept of access to justice. When you talk about access to justice, it, it, it actually means, of course, it's the physical, just the, um, the literal, in the literal sense, being a right of every, um, if you look at the justice system, it has the litigants. And in this case, we're looking at maybe even the children. We're looking at, and when you look at the children, you're also looking at their parents or their guardians who are supposed to support them throughout the justice system. You're looking at the officers, like every, every single person in the justice system. And um, as Honorable um, Kibose has talked about, when, when COVID started and um, people went digital, especially the judiciary, there were a lot of things that the judiciary did towards, um, by the help of stakeholders, trying to improve digital literacy. For example, the Law Society of Kenya was very active in doing a lot of um, awareness on how to use the e-filing platform, how to use um, the, the virtual platforms, and, and I think the practice directions did help. But I think there's still a lot to be done in as far as now uh, children, and I hope once the practice directions come out, those are some of the things that we'll do is improve the digital literacy especially for children. I think the first panel really alluded to um, how uh, knowledgeable or how digital literacy is spread out in Africa and in Kenya. 
we still have very low penetration. And that tells you that if that is not addressed, then the concept of access to justice will just be something that's in the air. It will just be an idea, but it won't be something that is actualized. So digital literacy is very, very important in as far as informing them how to use the platforms, why they are using the platforms, what are the ways they can use the platforms, what do they need to say, especially when it comes to children, these are a special group of, of, of people in our society, and there are certain rights of theirs that must be protected to an, ex an extent to secure their best interest. For example, privacy. So how do you maintain the privacy? You know, how do you access the platform and maintain your privacy? Is the e-filing platform also child-friendly? Maybe we can have like a child-friendly uh, interface where the child can actually go and access. I mean, this is my wild dream. They can go and access and just find that wow, okay, I can click here, know when my next court date is, know what the court said last time, be able to, you know, and also have the advocates, the prosecutors, everyone in that chain, and even the officers where they are, maybe if they're in remand, their parents know how to use this. So, yeah, I think that's what, would, what I'd have to say in as far as digital literacy and access to justice is concerned. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah, thank you for that response. And I'm also very curious to know that um, the, the exact situation with the people, with the children that we work with, um, maybe any statistics that you can share on how a certain student from, say, um, a rural background or from an informal settlement in Nairobi needed to get to court, but then you know, they went all the way and they were told the court is virtual and they don't have a computer or they don't have legal representation. Um, what is the situation for that child? Um, does the court give any grace, you know, to children in that situation? Okay, thank you very much for that question. Unfortunately, I don't have the exact statistics, but what I can say to that is that there's a real challenge there that's presented. Um, when you talk about access to even the digital um, skills and the literacy, of course, there's a segment of children who may not have that privilege, mm -hmm. you know, um, from um, low-income homes and, you know, informal settlements. And unfortunately, you find that they are the ones who are mostly um, victims of this. Um, they are probably the ones who are in contact with the law. And so it becomes a real challenge because access to even internet in those places is a real challenge. So does the court extend grace? I think that's something that is a very, um, it really depends on who you're before, I could say that. But in terms of, the, as a matter of principle, it should be. I think for children, there's a softer landing. Mm -hmm. um, and for a, child, uh, for a children matter, ideally, they should be supported by the help of an advocate who is able to inform them about that process. But of course, for a child who's not represented, there's a lot of things that may slip through the cracks. But uh, I know the judicial officers um, are really keen on, I mean, there's a lot of grace in as far as um, maybe coming to court and finding all oh, the court was virtual. But if they, I think currently, the court is actually still, until the practice rules are done, the court is encouraging the children to still come in person. Mm -hmm. And I'm really happy about the Children Act, the 2021 um, Act, which has actually really emphasized on that privacy during court proceedings for children. And that if, uh, you know, the children courts aspect, so even the people in that court are very well trained or should be trained on aspects to do with um, how this child would come into the court, what they should be informed of, and so on and so forth. Yeah, that's what I can say, unless uh, my fellow panelists have specific. Yes, she can answer for the court. Thank you. Um, I also see Valentine here with her mic ready to go. <laughs> I can say something on that. Uh, practically now, uh, we have the virtual sessions as well, but we still have the physical uh, physical aspect as well of court. So you can find that maybe, and, and for representation, I want to assure you that any child in conflict with the law is given a pro bono advocate as of right. Like there is no child who is in conflict with the law, especially in Milimani, I believe, who does not have legal representation. That, that is actually 
one of the first things we do after we approve charges, we make sure they have legal representation. Uh, secondly, I want to say that you may find that an advocate maybe is online, uh, but physically I could have the child in court as well. Mm -hmm. So I can be using my device. Uh, if the magistrates needs to see the child, of course we are sharing the device. I'm saying they're present here with me. They could be present with the advocate in their office as long as the court can see the child. So as much as we are using the virtual space, we've ne really not taken away absolutely the physical aspect of it. If you're not able to virtually engage, you can come to court physically, sit in the courtroom, make sure maybe the prosecutor is aware you are there so that like, if the session is completely virtual, I can include you. Or sometimes, like Madam. the child friendliness of these systems that we're using um, in the justice system and involving children and bringing children in these systems. Um, you know, whether it's e-filing or virtual courts, how would you say, how child friendly are these systems? Um, thank you for the question. I think um, where we are coming from as of now is from a place where we want to, um, first of all, establish uh, these systems and make sure they're in place mm -hmm. and make sure they're actually achieving uh, what we want them to achieve, um, key to which is actually access to justice. And um, there are very many aspects of access to justice, as uh, Joy mentioned. Mm -hmm. And um, I would like to go back first to digital mm -hmm. literacy mm -hmm. uh, because there's... there's three pillars of digital literacy. Um, there's your ability to find the information that you're right. looking for. So uh, assuming um, I have a matter uh, before court, but I am not able to find this information, that is one, as one pillar of digital literacy that I have already failed at, or that this system that we have put in place has already failed me at. And um, another consideration that we also have to put in place is um, cybersecurity for, for this accessibility of this or your ability to find these um, systems. Because um, sometimes you might find that uh, the systems have been compromised and whatever you are accessing is not actually what you're supposed to. You've been redirected to um, a malicious website and you are completely not aware mm -hmm. that you're actually in a completely different location from where you're supposed to be. Mm -hmm. And perhaps you're even giving out your own private information to these malicious people, and we don't know what they're going to do with this information, but we can always assume that it's not something positive. Um, the second pillar of this is uh, your ability to evaluate. So are we building these systems in such a way that um, when I find them, I am able to evaluate and say to myself that this is actually where I'm supposed to be? Mm -hmm. Or um, have we put in place enough security measures to make sure that even when someone tries to redirect me to somewhere that is not where I'm supposed to be, I can be able to tell that this is the right thing, this is, this is the wrong mm -hmm. thing. We have very many security uh, measures that we can put in place to ensure that uh, the people that we are targeting to use these systems are able to evaluate. And in this particular case, we, we've had the, um, from the child psychologist that um, the developmental capacity and the ability to be able to decipher um, this is wrong, this is right, perhaps might not be where uh, we want it to be. And so that's an, another consideration that we have to put in place, uh, even as we think about um, the evaluation capability of adults, then we also have to take into consideration the evaluation ca capabilities of children and build that into these systems and make sure that we are adding this extra layer of protection. Mm -hmm. Then finally, it's um, communication. So um, once you've found it, once you've evaluated it, are you able to communicate? Do you understand? So are we using language that um, allows them to interact with these systems? Is it difficult? Is it presented in a way that um, is not friendly to them? And beyond that, are we also building in accessibility measures for the differently abled mm -hmm. to make sure that uh, we are not also perpetuating another injustice yeah. through these systems? So uh, those are some very good uh, key considerations that then speak to access to justice. So. Um, my experience so far has been that uh, we are coming from a place where 
we are building these systems and trying to perfect them. So perhaps the considerations that we've, I have talked about and the considerations that my fellow panelists are going to talk about or have talked about might not have been um, key considerations when these systems are being put in place. Uh, for example, uh, when talking about virtual court attendance, um, I, I know when we, when, when we uh, are talking about physical court attendance, sometimes we take measures to protect mm -hmm. uh, the identity of the child. Right. So are we also going to translate that into um, the online platforms as well? What technologies are we going to put in place? And what considerations are we making for the uh, devices that these people are using to access these systems? Are they capable of running whatever applications that we're using to ensure the protection of these children? Mm -hmm. And um, we've had a lot of discussions as a country about how we have a good internet connectivity rates, but the numbers really do not speak to that. Um, the 2021 survey by the Communication Authority stated that there were more feature phones than smartphones in this country. Mm -hmm. So in, in as much as we are communicating that uh, we are really a developing nation and uh, we are putting in place measures, when we build out these systems to take all these considerations into place, then we, it, it also becomes a social issue. What else, what more can we do? What extra steps can we take to make sure... I mean, from the previous panel and from what we already know, the, on, the online space is not exactly, you know, the safest space to be in. Um, how do we protect data of um, children who are in conflict with the law? Um, how do we ensure that while, even though we're moving to a digital space, that we still are not infringing on their rights to a fair trial? And lastly, and this is expunged, and there are children involved in cloud or in whatever um, management, management is private and... Now, uh, what we agreed with um, is uh, we looked at other jurisdictions. We did a comparative study and realized that you cannot force parties to join online. They're supposed to request the court. Yeah. It, it, we, um, civil is easy because the checks and balances are not as many compared to a whole Article 50. Mm -hmm. The parties must request during pre-trials. We want to do it virtually. Because then if you force on the parties, the next thing the accused person will say, I, I didn't hear the court. The, it went off. I was forced onto the platform. That, again, we realized that would um, go again to request that they want to go virtual or not. Um, virtual, unless one or two would say, I would like to come physically, and I think because they had missed the court, one of them told me, I have just missed being in that building. So... <laughs> And of course, that's not a reason why you should come because we're encouraging you to go virtual. Right. So for the children, we have a general link. If you go right now to Milimani Locals Children's, um, the, the cause list, you'll find my link. Mm -hmm. So what I have done, that is my own innovation, is if when a child wants to talk to me virtually, view of the room where the child was, mm -hmm. screen, where I'm able to see the entire room mm -hmm. so that there's no one else in that room. Mm -hmm. That was the first check. Because I realized we needed to interview the child. Then he's created a link within a link, but in an open space where there was no... I've also told ICT not to uh, release any recordings of that child. So it is censored. Mm -hmm. So if, if, if I want that recording... I need to ICT to request for authorization for for that specific uh, session with the child. Mm -hmm. um, another thing that we do is we ensure that all children, especially if they're in conflict with the law, they do not turn on their cameras. Yes, and they don't talk to us in open court. They can listen to the advocate, they can listen to the court, but they can only access the listening part of it. No. If the child feels I need to talk to the court, then the person, the child is okay to talk. Then of course, then I will create another link within the link mm -hmm. for just the prosecutor, the advocate, myself and the child. Then we avoid, so that is what we do. And then also um, the other issue is uh, that you say data, the, the information I, about the, the children. Yeah. We the, code, we code like even in civil matters, we do not tell you the name of the child. 
-hmm. We would put initials. We'll initialize all our proceedings. Mm -hmm. And also when we do the, the e-judgments mm -hmm. and, and, and read them out, we also try as much as possible not to mention the... Even the parties, we've gone to the extent of not mentioning the names of the parties. Because when I say Brian Bright, of course, if you have a custody case, everybody will know it must be just the children, but also the parents. Because in that, the, the whole family is protected. Mm -hmm. Yeah. OK, thank you. And um, while we're also still talking about online crimes, and um, the previous panel did speak to this a little bit. Oh, yes, yes, please. We, last week, we had a meeting to develop an app Yes, so the good news is that there's going to be an app where children don't have to log in. Uh, if they want to talk to the court, they just need to, uh, to download the app. So we, we want to see how AI can help us to ensure that it's just that one child mm -hmm. by giving them an identifier mm -hmm. that, that only that child would have. So they will just have to download the app and then they're able to, to talk to the court. Okay. And then also for the civil space, I'm glad some of the advocates are here. We are also developing a co-parenting app where if parties don't want to talk to each other, <laughs> you can get the schedule for the whole year. If it's Parents' Day, you get it online. Then you get to tick whether you're attending or not. Yes, yeah, so that information will be shared to the, to the, to the parents. So yes, a co-parenting app is loading. And maybe we might need your expertise to see how we can make that work. So you can go to Apple Store and download our co-parenting app. Okay. And that was the innovation by yours truly. <laughs> well, well, yeah, co congratulations to you and, and the team. And I will actually hold the question that I had initially so that we can talk about AI um, a little bit. Um, obviously, everybody's talking about artificial intelligence and uh, Everyone's using it, you know, whether it's at school or at work, you know, to write your emails and um, to paraphrase things. Can we leverage AI in digital, um, leg digitized legal systems? Should we even dare do it? Um, you know, what are the pros and cons? And yeah, this is very much a Nelson <laughs> question. Um, I think there's different ways of looking at the usability of AI, what, what are your intentions? What do you want to use it for? Um, as the Honorable Kibosi has mentioned, uh, they, there is one way they are trying to use AI in, in their system, but broadly, people are using artificial intelligence for information. Mm -hmm. I want to know something, or I want to put down this information in a particular manner. Mm -hmm. I think that's the most widely used case of uh, artificial intelligence mm -hmm. at this moment in time. So. Um, when it comes to especially using it in, in legal procedures, I, um, it's a very sensitive issue. Mm -hmm. And it, I think it also applies to other things like the medical field as well. Because of the potential consequences, if AI gets it, where are we getting this data from Kenya law? Mm -hmm. That was um, one of the things that we look for in artificial intelligence is to understand where did you get your information from? Is it a credible source? And um, if you are asked to open up a program is actually um, what you say it is, or are you lying to us? Mm -hmm. Then um, another phenomena that we have is what we call uh, black box AI. Mm -hmm. It's where you're not able to explain how a decision has been arrived at by your artificial intelligence program. Mm -hmm. So it's most commonly happening in uh, deep learning systems. So it's whereby you just feed them data and they're able, based off of a few examples, the AI is able to learn and the AI arrived at this decision, then it becomes a problem because we lose the verifiability of this decision. Because if I'm able to tell you this is the thought process of my AI, it, let's say it took this case, it also took this case, did a comparison and told you this is what you, you should expect, then th that data is verifiable because that, that's also the procedure I will go through as an advocate uh, when I'm going through my case law to try and write my submissions and all that. So essentially, it all comes back to data. Um, how accurate is this data? How well was it pre-processed? Were there any violations of privacy, especially now that we, talk, we are talking about uh, these very sensitive cases of children? And I'm happy to hear that um, the courts take a lot of um, they take a lot of measures to ensure that um, the identities of these people are very well protected. And so um, there's really a lot of considerations that go into place. But 
I would say it's a very good tool if utilized, if built and use, utilized ethically. There are a lot of ethical considerations have, that have to go into place, and we as a society have to make a decision as to um, the rules that we need to put in place. We don't just have to leave it to government regulation because, or special interest groups, because with all these um, different kinds of interest groups, there will come different conflicting interests. So I think the approach that we need to take is to come up with a democratic process whereby we all get to decide um, what, what, how are we going to use this AI uh, sector but to adhere to those rules. Mm -hmm. And I think that would be the best approach um, to incorporate AI into the legal system. Okay. Yeah, and yeah, I think we, can't, we can never um, conclusively talk about AI in one, in one sitting and definitely um, is a conversation that I look forward to to um, foster in the future, especially even with the Wakilisha podcast. And yeah, um, the last question that I had was um, on online crimes and especially crimes that involve children and involve the person's, rather the person's crime is in Kenya. How do we prosecute these, um, you know, these crimes? How do we deal with such um, cross-jurisdictional issues here? Valentine. Uh, so for the cross-jurisdictional issues, they're very common because now the mutual legal assistance and extradition in some of these cases. Uh, mutual legal assistance is uh, the cooperation between states or countries to ensure that there is exchange and sharing of information. Uh, you might need uh, assistance from maybe the UK. Maybe the, 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 you, you found a victim in Kenya, right? And uh, you find a perpetrator in Kenya, I'm sorry, and the material they have is do investigations to try and collect as much information as you can, uh, sharing of data between the two countries. And also, you know, mutual legal assistance is not just uh, the treaties, it's also based on the principle of reciprocity. Mm -hmm. You know, if we don't have a treaty or anything like that, we have signed an agreement, uh, we can just agree that. Uh, I assist you, and in case this happens on my end as well, you can assist me. So mutual legal assistance is one of the avenues that is being utilized in cross-border crimes where the issues of jurisdiction come up. And actually, when utilized well, uh, prosecution is done and convictions are, are actually uh, reached. And the other, the other issue, I think, is extradition. Somebody can be extradited from one country to another to face charges. Trans there are solutions or things that are already being done um, to solve most of the problems that you know we're always talking about when it comes to children and conflict to the law. So um, we're very pressed for time, but um, I will give each one of you four. And yeah, we can start with you, Valentine. Uh, I think what, what we need to do the most is ensure that the ch these children are pretty. They are children who have already been violated in one way or another to these victims because you find that uh, a, a victim of a crime, maybe it's sexual in nature, which is very difficult to express. First reporting place is the parent. They have to narrate the whole story. And then they go to the investigator. They have to narrate the whole story. And then you come to the prosecution. I need to do pretrial to prep you. You narrate to me the whole story. You go to the magistrate, we narrate the whole story. You, you reach a point, the child tells you, Apana, nimesha kuambia. You know, you are reopening them over and over again. And it's a wound that's not even healing, mm -hmm. you know. So we have to find ways of which the ODPP is trying within the limits of the law and the rights of everybody. We have a pilot project for pre-recorded evidence. We want to try and see, is there a way we can pre-record this evidence so that all these justice actors, we can get this story all at once. We don't need to cause secondary trauma to the victim over and over again. So we are very passionate in finding ways to really, really make the justice system better for this, the experience in the justice system. It does not matter how they got there. We just want to improve what, what the, the experience in the justice system. So that's what I would say. Thank you, Valentine. Nelson? Yeah, I think... Um it has to be about protecting the children. Um, one thing that we have, we, we have failed at in our online communities is creating safe spaces. Yeah. We know how much abuse um, happens in, in online spaces, especially on social media. Um, 
uh, or platforms like WhatsApp and the rest. So we have to make sure that we are not um, transferring the failures of the online communities that we have already created onto what is essentially supposed to be a safe space um, for these children who've perhaps already gone through some kind of abuse. So we really have to uh, make a conscious effort to ensure that um, the technology side ensures protection, and even the rules that we put in place are very strict, so that there is no, there are no rooms or cracks okay. for this abusive behavior to also permeate into these um, spaces that are essentially supposed to be safe. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Joy? Um, thank you. So for me, my parting shot would be that let's not wait. Let's not wait for, um, I mean, the rules to be made. Let's innovate. I'm so happy to hear what Honorable Kibosia you're doing because that's innovative. You, you, you have a tool, which is the Children Act. You know what you need to do in as far as protecting their rights is concerned. So innovating, and I'm so glad to see people in the tech space, also in the legal space, because we need you. Uh, for me, I have the idea of this platform. You have the technical know-how you have the idea, let's come together, collaborate, and make sure that these children's rights are protected. Um, and again, I'll repeat, the platform that I see is one that um, is accessible to all the players, one that is able to even detect how long has this matter been in court. You know, is it, is it on the red line that it's passing the, the, the time period? You know, where is this child? What is the age of this child? And this platform should also be innovate all for the best interest of the children that we're trying to uh, protect and safeguard. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Joy. Um, you can change the view a date. So you, I'm learning that child is able to just click my diary, this date, let them communicate with me directly to them. And also, um, we need laws on Oxair, for instance. Share renting. Kenya is known being in Mombasa. You have exposed that. And you just need to pick a child you've shared online, whether it's on WhatsApp, mm -hmm. you know, WhatsApp story. We just pick that child's uh, image. We do AI on it. And we go and auction your child in a site. And they're, 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 I'm told the African child, is, we don't want to even know the hospital. Aga Khan, here I come. Labor, you know, you're mm -hmm. always, I mean, baby is here. You're posting their issues. Mm -hmm. We are dealing with a fake um, lifestyle mm -hmm. where you want to portray this kind of life, but we know you still live in Gidurai, yes? <laughs> that is the only thing I'll say. Share renting should now be an offense, punishable by, I don't want to say that. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank, you, thank you very much, um, Honorable Kibosia, Joy, Nelson, Valentine for a wonderful conversation. There's obviously so much to look forward to. Um, and like I said, these conversations, we cannot have a conclusive you know, conversation and say we've discussed children and digitized legal systems, and there's nothing more to say. So it's, thank you very much, and thank you everyone for listening. Everyone listening online, thank you so much. Oh. <laughs> Let us appreciate our panelists for the wonderful job they have done. <laughs> then our way, of course. Uh -huh. One, two, three, four, and finally, awesome, awesome. So at this point, I want to invite Mr. Gidaiga to come. We also want to appreciate our panelists for sharing. It's a pleasure of appreciating our very wonderful panel. Um, it's a very important discussion we've had about the digitized legal systems. Uh, so without further ado, uh, I'd like to start with the moderator, Mr. Brian Bright, uh, co-director of uh, communications at Wakilisha Initiative. Uh, so kindly, um, yeah. here's a small token of appreciation. Thank yeah. you very much. Can you just take a quick photo? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So thank you so much, Bright. Uh, the next person I'd like to appreciate uh, is Ms. Valentine Manyasi. Um, she is the prosecution counsel in the office of the DPP. Um, yeah. Uh, yes. 
So you can give them a round of applause uh, for the good work. Uh, next, uh, Mr. Nelson.
Have your seat, have your seat. Have your seat. Sio ilikuwa poa. Yeah? So you have my permission. Anywhere you go, you can quote me, use it, and get rich quickly. Make it more complex for others. You will get rich very quick and fast. Very good, very good, very good. Are you ready for the next session? You are ready? You are ready? Awesome, awesome, awesome. So, ladies and gentlemen, why don't you put your hands together as I invite this next individual, who is very familiar to all of us. She's been here before. You know her. Ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together for the CEO and founder of Wakilisha, Liz Jambi. Wapi makofi tafadhali? Hi, let's give her our, our clap. Let's go. Add. Add. Finally. Karibu sana Jambi. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon again. Are we learning? Yes. Are we learning a lot? Yes. Okay, as if you've seen me facilitate, I always speak on the people I know in the crowd, and I ask you questions. Olive, please tell me one thing you've learned today. Hi, everyone. Hi. Uh, my name is Olive. So... It was very interesting to learn that now in Milimani law courts, uh, each child who's in conflict with the law gets um, advocate representation. That was, it's very, very commendable and I'm really happy to learn that. And I hope that that can extend to other courts, not just Milimani. Yeah, Milimani is doing really, really well. We commend judicial officers, one of uh, who was here on Rabo Kibosia and many others for the fantastic job. Ah, yeah, someone else. Christine has been training. I wonder if you have learned as well. Christine has been training the children today. What have you learned today? Hello. Hi. Hi, I'm Christine from Gikar and Vadgama Advocates. Yes, I was training the children on child rights and responsibilities um, and uh, reporting mechanisms. I've also attended the last part of this session that was there before, and I'm really excited to hear about how the conversation about how we can use AI to ensure access to justice for children uh, and ensuring a safe space for them even as they access these legal services. Right. Thank you, Christine. Okay, so I want us to continue learning. Are you ready to continue learning? Aya, uh, is our media practitioners, are we here? If you're a media practitioner, please raise your hand. I know some are in the back doing some interview. Uh, claps for our media practitioners. Yes. Thank you. So I have a short presentation. By the time I'm done with that, the rest of the media teams will be here as well as the children and we'll do a very quick group work in the interest of time. So we can start with the slides. So today is the day of the African child for anyone who has not had. Does anyone not know that yet? We all know that. Is it today? Thank you. Very bright student. It is tomorrow, not today. <laughs> so this is the media training workshop. Uh, we can move on to the next slide. Yes, so we have been saying and you have been seeing Wakilisha and we've said Wakilisha Dark and all that. So who is Wakilisha? We are a non-profit organization. That does not mean that we do not work with other children because the goal is to make sure that children don't get into conflict with the law, right? And by that, you then must meet the rights or the other needs that might get them into conflict with the law. So we work with and for all children. Our mission is a child-friendly justice system. Uh, uh, our vision and our mission is to promote access to justice for children in conflict to the law. Our objectives are there. There are very many. And next slide. <laughs> I'm going to just be very, very fast with this. 
So basically, we are going to be talking about how exactly it is that we work. We've shared our mission and vision. We work in three main pillars. The first is legal representation. We have heard that Milimani Law Court is doing extremely well, and our goal, our vision is to make sure that that is happening in all courts, urban and rural, as far as children are concerned, that any child who gets into conflict with the law, as is happening immediately, they are assigned an advocate. So so the first is legal aid, and we work with advocates, some of whom are here, to offer that legal aid. The second is mentorship and skills development. So as you've been hearing, sometimes um, the lack of certain skills may lead children into conflict with the law, or because they're trying to fend for themselves and their families. So the justice system is supposed to, it meets the system. What else are they going to meet? Have they been equipped with skills that they are able to improve their lives with, for instance, um, to create a better life for themselves? So skills development. And then finally, public awareness and advocacy. How many of us? Yes, so we have the Wakilisha podcast where we intend to have, we do have already um, a season on juvenile justice in Africa, but mostly specifically in Kenya. I know you might be wondering, I asked a question, it was a really good question. I haven't seen it uh, answered on the panel. The questions are not lost. They are going to inform the topics that are going to follow beyond these three episodes, and we'll be identifying who to bring on those episodes. Right, okay, these were the draft slides, <laughs> but it's very okay. <laughs> That's fine. Um, so we have been hearing about what are the things that might lead children into conflict to the law, and I have a video that I'd like to play for you by our very own Miss Njehia. Did you hear Joy saying Miss Njehia is very special to us? Ms. Njehia has uh, really worked the journey with us. communities and that are extremely needy or vulnerable in terms of meeting their basic needs, their education, and uh, every other need are more at risk in the sense that uh, it's easy for them to be manipulated and they become even easier target of uh, grooming because most of the abusers will be grooming them by giving them things that uh, go towards meeting their basic need. And then the other factors are the children who are in need of care and protection, children with disabilities, children with a neglect experience, children who are in the child-headed household, children in families or communities that are extremely needy or vulnerable in terms of meeting their basic needs, their education, and uh, every other need are more at risk in the sense that uh, it's easy for them to be manipulated and they become even easier target of uh, grooming because most of the abusers will be grooming them by giving them things that uh, go towards meeting their basic need. And then the other factors are the children who are in need of care and protection, children with disabilities, children with a neglect experience, children who are in the child-headed household, children who are either they themselves have a chronic illness or children who are also growing up in a family where a parent or a significant caregiver or a primary caregiver has a, a chronic illness, children who are growing up in the communities where they are witnessing a lot of violence because of the destabilization that comes with the violence and the children who are not attending school. They don't have a schedule, they don't have very close supervision. So a couple of factors, but they are all around the child vulnerability. Thank you. Uh, thank you. So what is the main takeaway? What makes children uh, into, leads children into conflict or contact with the law? Child? Child? Yes. Who said? Someone said. Someone said the answer here. Child vulnerability. All of those reasons that she has just stated really highlight the vulnerability of children. And often the factors that may lead them into contact also lead them into conflict. Now, before I proceed, what is the difference between a child in conflict and a child in contact with the law? Do we know? How many of us know? 
Okay, fantastic. The wakilis. Okay, <laughs> I'm seeing you. So a child in contact with the law is in the judicial system in one way or another. So it could be that they are victims, or it could be that there's a family matter, say a custodial matter or something. So there's, or they were witnesses of something and they must give their testimony. So a child in contact with the law is in the system. A child in conflict with the law is answering to um, a charge. Yeah. So that is the main difference, and you can see the points that we have just heard from Ms. Njie here. So we want to proceed to the next stage. So this is where it gets interesting. You've been hearing from panels, you have heard a little from me, now it's time to hear from each other. Are you ready? Are you ready? Yes, so I'll just ask, I don't know if the children are ready at the back. So what it is, we're going to organize ourselves in 10 groups. We are about 80 people. So 10 groups of eight, not a lot of movement, just as you're seated, um, move your seat a bit. Find eight or so friends. Or let's start with five. I'm not sure what the numbers are looking like at the moment. So find about five friends. Make sure there's at least one media practitioner in that group. Even if you came as two media practitioners from the same... Uh, organization, if it's possible to split, split. Hiya, are we ready? Are we in groups? Are we in groups? Hiya. Five people, who is your media personality? Who is your media personality in the group? Okay, fantastic. Uh, media personalities, please raise your hand. <laughs> if you're two, boot one out. Tell them bye. <laughs> Does every group has a, have a media personality? Does every group have a media personality? Okay, I want to see the groups. So this is group one. Awesome. This is group one. Group two, you're the media personality. Good. Um, the Nelson's group, Athena, yes. Who's your media? Fantastic. Olive? Is your yes, yes, hi. Uh, oh, sorry, group one, group two, group three, please note your numbers, group four. And then, is that another group? I'm not sure how many Ibiana answers. You look like you're too close. <laughs> okay, group four, and then there's group five. Eh? Group five, who's your media personality? Yes, I, yes, I've seen you. Group six, who's your media personality? Good. Are you you're all set? Yes. So one thing I'd like Esther and David to help us. Sorry, sorry. In each group, please make sure you have at least two children. But you must be careful. They must sit together because uh, if they are facing each other, it will be difficult for the cameras and the uh, yeah the cameras to move around, and we do not capture their images. So make sure they are seated together. At least two children in every group. Uh, and, le and let us balance them like this, uh, Esther and David. One child in conflict, the law, one child at risk for each group. One child in conflict, one at risk. So you have a good balance. Are you welcoming the children in your group? Aya. Ah, yeah. Simbona sioni waki smile. Okay, so as the children sit, just to note that this is not a story collection exercise. So you may not use. Okay, let's just move around first.
Are we good? Are we good? Mkosawa? Group one, eh? Group one, eh? Group two, eh? Ah, you people, you've not welcomed your children. They would be much happier. Group one, eh? Aya. Blue boys. Blue boys. Mraniskia. Blue boys, eh? Blue boys, eh? I'm just Shiba. <laughs> okay, so each group has a media personality and has a child in conflict with the law or children in conflict with the law and a child at risk. And that risk does not mean that there's anything happening to them, but basically if all our children are not protected, they could fall victim, right? Great. So are we ready? Are we ready? Yes. I have group one, eh? Yes. Group one, eh? Yes. Group two, group two, eh? Yes. Group three? Yes. Okay, group four? Yes. I am Jarubu Kidogo. Group four? Yes. Good, group five? <laughs> group six? <Yeah>. Ah. <laughs> Hi, Julu. That's one of our star advocates there. Okay, so we are ready to start, yes? Can you see the screens? Can you see the screen? Yeah. Okay, so um, I'm giving each group one question, okay? The first, the ones with the orange background are questions or topics for discussion. The sensitivity of language. Why must we be careful with the words we use? So I've been saying children in conflict with the law. Uh, do we say accused persons when we are re referring to children? Do we say sentenced? Do we say juveniles, for example? What are the words? Are there certain words we use and certain words that we don't use? So group one, your question is the sensitivity of language. Why must we be careful with the words we use around children matters? And you can tell us, so one of the things to tell us is, what are some of the words you know that are, work for adult stories but not for minors? Remember, this is a media training workshop. So as the media is reporting on stories, words not to use, okay? Rupwan, are you ready? Now you must uh, select your group leader because they will do an exercise after this. Group one, you're good? Yes. Group two, privacy. We've been hearing a lot about privacy today, right? How does privacy balance with the need to protect and the child's right to privacy? So that is the question. Um, do children have a right to privacy? And if yes, what does this look like? What does it mean? Group two? You're good? Yes. So what is the right to privacy? Again, focus as far as it relates to the media. We've also, we've been having um, safeguards around pictures and all of those things. So what are the various privacy concerns when you're talking about children? Group three, participation. Do children have a right to participation? Should the children be in this media training, first of all? Should they be here? Do you think there's a reason they had their training, but they're out and they're here with us for this one? Aya, you'll tell us. Do children have a right to participation? Should their views be heard and struck or respected? And for the media again, how do you center the views and the voices of the children? What, today we are talking about the day of the African child. Sindio, okay, we've said we are all African children, but am I, am I still an African child? I am. Okay, but can the media write today's story only about Jambi and Liz and the Wakilisha team? Can they do that? Because at the end of the day, it's not about me, it's not about us, it's about the children. So you'll tell us a bit more about that. Uh, group four, where are we? Group four. Uh, consent. So, can children give consent for the use of their images and their stories and what is informed consent? What is informed consent as far as children are concerned? 
So what is uh, consent around children matters? Group five, group, group five, yes? Group five, um, child rights. So we've said Wakilisha, we deal with children in conflict to the law and we've said who they are. Are there specific rights that are for children in conflict to the law? We know their child rights, Sindio, in general. But are there specific rights that are rights for children in conflict to the law? What are they if they exist? Are we together? You're thinking of your answers, I hope. <laughs> so, the, okay, wait. There's one more group, right? There's a group six. Group six, eh? Yeah. I love it. Okay. As the star group so far, uh, group two, you pull your socks up. <laughs> now, you have the privilege of choosing out of those five questions, which one do you want to handle? Quick fire. There is sensitivity of language, privacy, Participation, consent, child rights. Actually, I'll, I'll, I'll assign you the rights of the child in conflict with the law. Sawa. Okay. So basically, what? And then a secretary. Okay, your group leader is leading the conversation. He's saying, so I think you'll select who seems like they can bulldoze people and tell them, wewe ongea, ni wewe, ni wewe next. Then your secretary is supposed to note down your points. So secretaries, go to menti.com. Are you writing? Menti.com. Menti.com, and the code is, please note that it's different from the other one for the panels. So this one for media training workshop is 5222 5222-4687. Seven. So that is where you note down all of your points. Because in the interest of time, you might not be able to list them all, but you want to ensure that they are captured. And again, as I've said, whatever is discussed here will be featured later. Are we ready? Okay, who is your group leader here? Yeah. Elvis. Ah, yeah. Who is your secretary? Fantastic. Volunteers. I love volunteers. Okay, group two. Who is your leader? Very nice. Fantastic. Who is your secretary? Fantastic. Group three. Leader. Uh, secretary. Ah, they are ready. They are ready. Group four. Group four. Leader. Secretary. Secretary. Olive. Fantastic. Group five. Leader. I hear. Uh, secretary, secretary, fantastic. Thank you. Group six, leader, uh -huh. secretary, good. Ah, yeah. So have a discussion. There are no right or wrong answers. And as your group, you decide exactly how you're going to shape that conversation. So pressure kidogo kwa leaders, but everyone should have an opportunity to say something. And most especially who? I love it. Ah, yeah. Good students. <laughs> uh, how many, uh, MC Wakili, how many minutes do I have? What time, who knows what time we started? Okay, we are running very much behind time, so let's do as fast as we can, 10 minutes, okay? 10 minutes. So at exactly 1.10 p.m., I will be asking you to present a few things. Good, 10 minutes? Yes, MC has said 10, mi 10 minutes are good. I need to be hearing mamas and stuff happening. Uh -huh. Yes, uh -huh. yes.
uh, here I hear the discussions are ongoing. Secretaries have points. Secretary one, if you. supposed to be asked, asking questions. What do you mean? Some of them are saying, Okay, it is going. Is it gone? It is going. Okay. 
How are you guys, group six, group five in the back? Okay, we want to wrap up in the next one minute in the interest of time. We hope to have future media training workshops. Look at the start team, they are done. Group six is done. <laughs> They're even telling me to Malize. Okay, one minute, I am counting it down. At 1.15 p.m., we should be done. Hi, are we done? Yes, we should be done. Discussions at this moment. Have you learned anything? Is there any group that we leave saying, I didn't learn anything in that workshop? Have you discussed some? Now stop. Uh -huh. Group two to Malize. Five, you're done. Okay, group two, are you done? Fantastic. You are in, uh, will that be a challenge? Can they stand from where they are or come here? From where? Okay, yeah. So you can stand from where you are in the interest of time. Tell us one thing that stood out. I've read some of your responses. So as you think about consent, shh, can we, we are here. Are we here? Are we here? Yes. So when we are talking about consent, I've seen someone say that children are always wondering how is giving this consent going to benefit me? That was very interesting. So how is the, how is, I must show the story of this child, but how is it benefiting that child? So that was very interesting. Uh, so we can start with the presentations, group one. Who's speaking? Just tell us, not everything you discussed, one interesting thing in the interest of time. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Elvis. Um, one thing that we kind of learned from the value of language is the fact that children need a reassurance that they're not their actions. And language that's used when defining a child, when talking to a child, when um, making any form of reference to a child, it's usually based on what they did rather than who they are. And so when in terms towards reassuring them that they are better than their actions and they are better than their circumstances. Okay, thank you. Um, Akofi, we were taught, uh, add another one. Apana, we, are, we are starting with one. Okay, we start with one. Add another one. Another one. The next one. Uh -huh. I love it. Uh -huh, group two. Hi. Hi. My audible. Yes, you are. Okay. So our question was on privacy and whether children have the right to privacy. And we established that children do have the right to privacy. However, um, we discussed the balance and the extent to which this can be done while also protecting the children. And we were lucky to have um, a prison officer with us who gave us some good examples of how they achieve this balance. So maybe when um, a child is coming from court and they have to conduct a search. If she's a girl, she'll be taken to a private room with a, an, an officer who is also a lady to conduct the search. She also said um, in the dormitories, the children are offered privacy in the evening, 6 p.m. emergency. So I think in that way we were able to discuss a balance between right to privacy and also protecting children. Yeah. Thank you very much, group two. Group three. Three. <laughs> Four. Good. Group three. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Sheldon. You are the genius team. <laughs> our question was, do children have right to participation? And our answer was yes, because when we invite, a child doesn't know what's wrong or what's right, 
the child the child can apparently lead herself to crime life and even behind bars and we don't want that to happen yes and the genius presenter Cindy yes thank you so much for that group 4 Uh, ours is a balance, however, there is a, uh, it needs to be, okay, when you talk of consent, it needs to be an informed consent. If this, you're taking it, uh, it's not explained to me. If I'm being sponsored by an organization and they want to take photos with me, um, I have a choice. You really don't have a choice. You have to take the photo. Uh, so that's the situation of many children. We're saying uh, it's, then imperative for adults to ensure that even as they uh, ensure, as they take and um, for the children on, their ha on the other hand to understand and not just understand, but also get to give that consent. It's also pegged on guardians and parents who get to sign consent forms to their children. Why? Yes, it should be informed. Thank you. So always, I am a coffee. Oh, Tomesa, how? Okay. I'm not being a very good uh, MC. <laughs> okay, one, two, three, four. Uh -huh. Good. That was group uh, four, yes? So group five. Do children in conflict with the law have rights? The rights of a parent, they all have rights. And one of the rights uh, of a child who is in conflict with the law is they have a right to be represented by a lawyer. They have a right to, to be bailed, like a bond, so that they have a right to be They have a right to be protected. Now, sisi we are about to be able to be able to be able Wanazipata wakiwa mahali wako. So, ni hai kwa sasa. Asante sana. Ehe, makofi. And another one for Kiswahili. We must. Sindio? Ehe. One. Yo mweke ngufu sana. Two. Three. Four. Thank you very much, Group 5. Uh, right projects that we are going to be undertaking soon. So, yes, more to follow on that. Group six. Hi. Hi. My name is Sentry, and we were discussing about children's rights. And what we have learned that is four pillars of right. We have four pillars of right. One is survival right, development right, protection, and participation. Development, we have education and security. African child. We are, we are proudly group six. Thank you very much. Have, uh, you have learned something, yes? Yes, so when we invite you for another um, so thing, and we'll find a way to highlight. So the children during this workshop do not post anyone's story, okay? Thank you. Okay, good. Esther, I see you. So uh, we can clap for the children as they... told from group one contact in inini but nailewa can you nasema ama are you just giving an understandable l3 aya thank you <laughs> thank you so much for your time Thank you. Let's appreciate uh, Njami for such a wonderful job she's done. Sindio, appreciate her. Ah, you're good students. I want to invite the panelists, they come. So I want to invite, she is a department Wakilisha. Athena, so Kab, fellow regional project manager, Wicked Children. Shall fund Kenya. And not least, I want to know. Karibu uh, Gearing of you. 
Huh? Did I hear no? Do you? Remove it, hold it, and need you to jot something down for me. Take a notebook, take your pen. You have them? Write number one. Write number one. You appreciate number one? Touchable. If you are, you are stranded on a, on a dis uh, uh, cup, uh, my brother, uh, you know, you're done. Sindio? So this is question two. Like you can leave some space. And if you see, mm -hmm. and then finally, the last question. I can see you. Meshanza kuandika up. Yeah. Weka ata wa Kenya. Najua wengine wenye wa munajua tu local. Simple boy. I know you. Now, now. <laughs> Why? Sini celebrity. What is? Have you written? You've written your celebrity? Nasi jese ma crush. Celebrity. If you are done, raise your hand. Oh, in fact, it. And then fold it and then lift it. Fold it like we did last time. And then lift it and say, mm, this is mine. Fold it. Lift it with some confidence. Lift it up. 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 Close your eyes and say, go to your new owner. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, umeshika? Umekunja? Sawa. And please, when you throw, throw it in front. Someone here was complaining. Three, two, one, throw. If you think your list is so interesting, I need you to share. If that person is stuck in an island, what will they? The three items they will carry. The second one was what? What animal would they be? And then the last one was? What is the last question, guys? Celebrity. To answer, Aya, huh? please share. What, what did the writer write? Answer to one. Okay. So for question one, um, the writer would carry a phone, a book, an eagle. This is interesting because I wrote the same. It's not mine. <laughs> and the celebrity is Eminem. Cool. It's a cool kid right there. Eminem. It's a cool kid. Okay, who has an interesting one? This is your chance. You are okay. We have someone there. Um, I think mine is very interesting because of the animal they want to be, but let me just read the list. So if they were to be stranded in an island, they'd carry water, food, and a tent. They'd like to be a porcupine. I want to know why. <laughs> and, uh, okay, they've li they've, they didn't follow instructions. They've written three celebs, so I'll just read all of them. Celine Dion, Luther Van Ross, and Michael Bolton. <laughs> The edge is showing. <laughs> <laughs> eh, tukua miapo kwa porcupine. Who? Unataka kurushia nani hizi makombora? Yeah? Who is the porcupine? Okay, but that's interesting. Na hapo kwa kupika meka watu watatu. Uyo lazima ni keta rapia. Unajua unataka kulisha watu watatu kwa hii ekonomi yetu. Eh -huh. One more? Okay. I have one gentleman at the back before I hand over to the panel. Nilisema mumefinya hapa hata hakuna nafasi. Na inakaa hiyo pokipa nilitoka hapa. Hii answer inakaa hapa. I have a feeling. Uh -huh. Hello, good afternoon. I stand to read this on behalf of the person that has handed over this. Uh, so the first question, the three items are matchbox. The second item is a panga. The third one is a fishing rod. A fishing rod. Yeah. Uh, the second question is an eagle. The answer to the Hello, Washington. You have one. of clarification. An island. What is the composition of... I'll send you my fee notes. Siyezi kukupatia answer hapa na unajawudi ya nilipa. Utalipa kwa. You get stuck in an island. Get our panelists. Over to you. All right. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Is everyone having a good time at Hot 96? I feel the way 
children. I'm really happy to be here. Um, yeah, so we're going to just have the panel introduce themselves really quickly, and then uh, we'll pick it from there. <laughs> Thank you, Terry. Could be very lively because it's lunch hour and the uh, concentration span is very low. So, good afternoon, our International Center for Missing and Exploited, uh, on issues of online solicitation and missing. Mic test. Karen <laughs> I am the co advocate in here. You know. <laughs> do commercial aspects of yes and I'm uh, so happy to be here and so happy to see all of you thank you good afternoon hello yeah this is much better so good afternoon everyone good afternoon um, as means is to have the opportunity of working programs that create legal awareness for know their rights we basically try to create awareness for them great now before every child what right would that be uh, one right yeah I think the right to be heard, uh, mm -hmm. my, my own practice this side. And I think sometimes they just very important. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, would love to hear from you, Karen. What right would that be? <laughs> Presentation yeah. to see a child view, yeah. you know, the right to speak in. Mm -hmm. They've said, and mm -hmm. the most common we work eight to four that stated that parents between 4 p.m. and 5 p.m. must be with their children mm -hmm. just to do anything that is not interact and engage with them. Mm -hmm. and it's about also intentional parenting. Yeah. So I guess it's something that we could take home. Now let's get to what the, you know, the panel is about today. And we'll start with you, Athena. Now, based on the work to other African countries, mm -hmm. earlier this year, ECMEC did a NPA by the Directorate of Children's Services. Right. And one of the key gaps we saw, especially in relation relation to policy was in terms of terminologies. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the challenges comes in when you call a crime, when you point out a crime for what it is, mm -hmm. it makes it easier to prosecute. Right. So we have an international guideline known as the Luxembourg Guidelines. Mm -hmm. They state what abuse, particular abuse is called, mm -hmm. and how it affects a child. Mm -hmm. So let me give an example. We have the term pornography. Mm -hmm. In all laws, we talk about child pornography, adult pornography. Mm -hmm. But legally speaking, pornography connotates that the person who is involved in that act has the mental capacity to give consent. Mm -hmm. Then the question becomes, does a child have the right to give consent? A child is not capable of giving consent. Anyone under the age of 18 cannot give consent. So when you see roughly, because it's like saying the child agreed to it. Right. So what we call that, or what the guidelines, it's so when you go to court, don't say the actual abuse material. When you're in the process of being uh, modified and edited to factor this in, but that was one of the key gaps that we saw as we were looking at it. Mm -hmm. In terms of structure also, uh, I'd but... It is centrally located in terms of implementation. Yes. We have child-friendly court systems, which is a good thing, mm -hmm. but it's only in Nairobi, mm -hmm. and I think one more in Shanzu. Yeah. And Kenya is very big, so sometimes we may have the policies that speak to it, yeah. but the implementation bit of it has not been spread out to reach the children, not just in the capital city, right. but all the other areas within the country. Yes. And that goes down also to the empowerment of the caregivers. That's like the law enforcement who do investigation mm -hmm. or the prosecutors. Mm -hmm. They know how to um, t refer children. But then again, it's something that is centralized. So there is that need to make sure that the law is not just operating within in the Nairobi. capital city, right. but also in other aspects. Mm -hmm. Then it's um, the fact that everything is in Nairobi. Where is parliament? Mm -hmm. It's in Nairobi. Right. Where is the children? Mm -hmm. Or I empower people in Nairobi, mm -hmm. for example, as a CSO, you'd think that you get more publicity for it mm -hmm. and uh, you get more money for it. Mm -hmm. But then that is uh, a mentality we need to change because mm -hmm. We are in this for the service of the children. Yes. Yeah. So because it will be a bit more expensive to go to Garissa, for example, like what the DCS did yes. uh, last week. Mm -hmm. But because we don't want to spend a lot of money um, going interior and doing the work, mm -hmm. we'd rather do somewhere where people have already laid the foundation. So it is just, it's easier to it's build easier. up on it. Right. Yes. All right. Um, uh, speaking about 
uh, being away from Nairobi. Uh, in fact, we were supposed to have more people on the panel, but Eunice Kilundo, who is the child protection and advocacy manager at Child Fund, is not here with us because she is in Busia. However, she was very kind to answer this question as well. Um, what are the gaps? And I am sure we are going to have that answer right now. Um, kindly. My name is Eunice Kilundo. I work for Child Fund Kenya as the Child Protection and Advocacy Manager uh, based at the country of Eastern Nigeria. Child Fund's main mandate is to make sure that all children are protected and are enabled to actualize their potential and to live a full life. One of the gaps and a real glaring gap is the lack or inadequate capacity of service providers within the justice system to support children in terms of ensuring their digital safety. Um, children will need guidance from the people that are taking care of them. And so if the person who is mandated to provide such guidance does not have sufficient um, knowledge or information on the subject, uh, and in this case, digital safety, then you find that they are not able to take care of the children or to protect them. Uh, from on, online risks. The fact that uh, the, the government has not provided enough facilities to separate child victims and children offenders, uh, it becomes a problem because children offenders uh, could have been given access to, you know, digital harms or may have lived within a reasonably protective environment, uh, there is that possibility of these children uh, poisoning each other, quote unquote. And so these child victims who came in without knowing so much about how to engage digitally, leave that place able to do that, but access, accessing uh, wrong, uh, wrong and harmful content. And uh, in that way, their digital safety is compromised, accumulated into the community in terms of ensuring community preparedness to receive them and to protect them. Uh, they, there is no sufficient pre, pre, uh, protection or uh, safeguards put in place integration mechanisms to make sure that uh, communities are well aware of their uh, online risks um, and they are able to protect children within the digital space. Right. Uh, so what I'm getting from uh, Eunice is that uh, sufficient protection one and also the, re the need to reintegrate the children back in you know to the society and I could see you Elvis nodding uh, as we're talking about the gaps perhaps you might want to add on to that I think in terms of the gaps um, agreeing with Eunice uh -huh. is right. so like what we were saying earlier with group one in terms of not identifying a, a child by the activities mm -hmm. you know reminding everybody the simple message that you're not no one teaches or is that open? Yes, you'll suffer. Yes, the other day you will reach the other side. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Okay. So now, if you remember the previous panel. Uh... Well. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that they're really trying. Mm -hmm. Seeing COVID pandemic, mm -hmm. trying, mm -hmm. as a person who are more still needs to be done, mm -hmm. maybe Twis and I have alluded to the right to participation mm -hmm. because we want the children to be heard mm -hmm. and we want them to participate. And these uh, digital tools being employed, Honorable Kiposia was saying, mm -hmm. they should be able to indicate. Yeah. There's more that needs to be these facilities as well. Mm -hmm. Be not only the access to the digital tools, but you know, by the internet. Yes. So if at all there would be stakeholder participation to uh, uh, fla far flung areas, mm -hmm. that would be much, much better yeah. because without the capacity and the resources, 
then the system we want to integrate fails. Mm -hmm. The court system to be a digital one yeah. will definitely fail. So, hey, yeah. I like that. You know, I love the fact that we're having solutions. Uh, as much as we're saying these are the challenges, we almost know what we need to do, right? Um, but I want us to move a tool that you have relied on in highlighting cases of missing children, right? Mm -hmm. um, however, sometimes when children are found, they can be vilified, right? And people have a lot to say on social media. So where do you draw that line between we want to find a missing child and also protecting them? Because when they are found, people might say, okay, we need to know where the child was. We need to know what they were doing. You know, people have a lot of opinions, right? So where do we draw that line? And how has, you know, that been in your organization? That's an interesting question. Yeah. And I'd, I'd like to sound a bit shrewd and say that's none of their business. Right. Because at the end of the day, Terry, your life is your own, right? Mm -hmm. If, God forbid, um, I am traveling and then I get into an accident and I say, guys, pray for me. Mm -hmm. I got into an accident. It's not, you don't need to know where I was coming from right. or who I was meeting, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's the same way that we may treat adults on social media mm -hmm. that we see is being um, reflected to children. Right. And I'd like to say that uh, when we're doing trainings, one of the things we say that the fact that anyone is on social media mm -hmm. stands as a child, yeah? Mm -hmm. So let's talk about missing children. Um, in Kenya, we have not yet fully adopted the system of using social media. Mm -hmm. We have tried. Yes. There are some steps that are being taken. Mm -hmm. But compared to other jurisdictions, there is a more involved and integrated method mm -hmm. of using social media to create alerts for missing children. Yes. And they, they are seen as very fruitful. Mm -hmm. For example, um, for urgent cases, there's, there's a system known as the Rapid Emergency Alert System. Mm -hmm. So if I'm walking with my son in the mall and then he gets lost and I call and I report it, all the security guards in that uh, mall yes. will get an alert. Mm -hmm. This child is missing right now. He was dressed like this. Um, the, the police officers who check at the gate and also a few traffic spots within the a perimeter of the said mall mm -hmm. will immediately be alerted to that and people will also be able to see it because it's on social media yes. and that means that whoever has taken my child at that particular moment could be stopped even before they get out of the mall mm -hmm. yeah so you see that is a very good use of social media and technology platform mm -hmm. to prevent going there and we are hoping to work with the government to get there yes. but now as you can say it locally we have the missing children Kenya mm -hmm. who put out posters of yes. missing children they'll put probably their name the work the parent does yeah mm -hmm because it is what will help you mm -hmm. um, be able to locate this child. Right. But the moment the child has been located, they're supposed to be what we call takedown procedures, mm -hmm. so that the photos, the posts, and all this information that we used, we shared yes. to look. Um, now the people who are demanding to know other things. And then I just say this, um, the fact that I have posted on social media does not mean that you're entitled to the entire key. Yeah. We are all on that platform. Mm -hmm. The same way someone can take my photo and make a stupid meme of it yes. is the same way they can do with a child. So I don't developing a tough skin mm -hmm. because there are things we can't protect them from. Right. But also other than that, we need to show them how to navigate the platform abused online and they're not aware of it. Yeah. So capacity building and awareness creation is very important, but not just to us as adults, mm -hmm. but your child, the moment they start interacting with technology, the moment they start interacting with any social media application mm -hmm. regardless of age you develop with them and let them know the challenges they're likely to face right. and not just challenges but also the positive sides of it mm -hmm. yes so you really have to be intentional intentional <laughs> yes, yes. Um, all right so I think I'll come to you um, uh, Elvis I remember uh, you know being in law school and one of the things our lecturers used to want us to say is, why do you want to become a lawyer? Have they want to help. So for someone who is probably studying the law, they're a student, they're a law student, is there anything they can do right now? Yes, certainly. Mm -hmm. um, so this kind of gives me a back, um, reminds me of a back, you know, as a first year with, you know, the rights of a thousand people, say in Madare mm -hmm. or somewhere else in I don't know, in Kitui. Yes. I hope my ancestors don't punish me. But, um, <laughs> you know, ideally, 
these lawful people mm -hmm. because at the end of the day, I'm mm -hmm. and in that entire process, there's, there's need to simplify these concepts, yes. you know, like our finance bill. Break it down for a layman in such a way that when public participation comes, mm -hmm. they're able to take, go into um, informal settlements, mm -hmm. um, do um, a bit of research on terms of what, what information do they want to know about mm -hmm. the law. And now we basically go back with them and teach them how to break down those concepts into Sheng, <sighs> hardest part, but it's possible, mm -hmm. and let them go out there and actually see what happens. Um, for the students that have been in my class, I always tell them that deal with it tomorrow, you know, or something of the sort. Right. But I told them that they need to expose themselves to what comes outside of the four walls of the university. Mm -hmm. The four years that you have of getting a law degree I was in first year. Yeah. And ideally, it's that exposure to what happens outside there that helps. Mm. So one would be engage and volunteer in, you know, activities and law clinics and organizations that are taking part in helping society. Yeah. You learn, you'll expose your sick knowledge on the rights of an arrested person. You have the right to keep quiet. And we're having a paralegal training for um, um, leaders in Kibera. Mm -hmm. So why are you disrespecting me? It, 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 it did impact how I saw the... All right. So there is something that you can do as a student. Um, and Karen, maybe you could speak to the role of pro bono advocates when it comes to creating a safe um, environment. Okay, well, the, the right to legal representation is one of the most fundamental yes. when we are talking about access to intention and mm -hmm. there can be no access to justice. Right. So the role of pro bono advocates who do not expect to, you know, get paid is actually very important because one of the limits of the lim or the limitations to why people are not able to access justice is um, the money factor. Mm -hmm. The fact that they cannot be able to afford uh, yeah. promoting uh, access to justice. Mm -hmm. So pro bono advocates in, in themselves are very essential in the justice system. And for, for them to properly exercise their roles and to be able to offer this um, pro bono services to children, you know, they must create capacity in themselves mm -hmm. because you cannot give a service that you're not aware of how to give it. Mm -hmm. Pro bono advocates play a very important role in as he has said, uh, we're the ones who have access to these tools, access to the law, and we're the ones who bridge the gap between the legislatures and the legislature and mm -hmm. uh, the society in terms of understanding the law, what the law stipulates, and what the law requires. Right. So pro bono advocates have um, a huge responsibility. Mm -hmm. In as much as they are not being paid, their their contribution is quite huge. Mm -hmm. Be it in uh, in in promoting conversation about policy development or policy creation, be it integrating systems that will promote uh, their systems, manage their records. I mean, their role is is and can be diversified yes. from the provision digital literacy skills, mm -hmm. like we have done today with the children. Mm -hmm. We have uh, integrated and brought together stakeholders in Tishon part. There's a lot that um, advocates uh, in the pro bono sector can do. So it calls for having a, a broad mindset mm -hmm. and being open-minded to where mm -hmm. you can actually chip in. All right. Being broad-minded and just opening your mind to so many things that you can do. Um, now, unfortunately, I feel like, yeah, we could go on, but we really cannot. Uh, but I think that's the beauty. We can always continue this conversation on the podcast. Um, however, just before, about keeping their children safe in this digital environment. Intentional parenting. Mm. Uh, the reason for this is because the laws could be there. Mm -hmm. Artificial intelligence could step in and create all these parameters and boundaries. Right. But at the end of the day, if there is no intentional conversation about mm -hmm. the safeguards that are in plus say no and when to report them, yes. technology will not operate in a vacuum. Mm -hmm. As parents, as stakeholders, as lawyers, all of us here have a mandate to play in terms of capacity building and creating awareness mm -hmm. so that children and even adults can know the 
the measures that are there in place to keep themselves safe, to, mm. to restore themselves to a point of safety. Right. Thank yes. you. Elvis, quickly. Um, first thing that came to my mind when I heard about intentionality was this cliche statement that it takes a village to raise a child. Mm -hmm. Every time um, a person thinks of the village, we always think of the waze. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But we also forget the fact that, you know, there's, there's power and there's some beauty in having a peer village, mm -hmm. you know, a village of peers. Mm -hmm. And to the parents and caregivers, I, I would say that it's important for them to recognize the value of, you know, the peers in co-parenting with them, mm. you know, so telling them about this TikTok thing that they're hearing about, mm -hmm. or this dance challenge that's happening, you mm -hmm. know, and explaining it to them and breaking it down to them yeah. could actually really, really complement the intentionality. Amazing. Karen? Okay. Uh, parents and guardians are the first point of call. When you're growing up, whatever you learn, whatever you observe, mm -hmm. come from the people who are closest to you. And uh, for most people, that's the uh, parents or guardians. And their role cannot be game set after that. The way they, the parents also use the same technology themselves mm -hmm. is important. Yes. If they are constantly posting this, commenting that on Twitter, being a keyboard warrior, mm -hmm. or uh, cyberbullying and whatever, um, it starts from where the child grows up. Mm -hmm. It starts from how they see other people use and utilize the internet. So it is important for uh, parents and guardians or people even in an influential position or capacity to be very wary or very aware about how they use the internet because everyone, mm. the children are watching, mm -hmm. everyone is watching. So monkey see, monkey do. Yes. You can't tell me not to do this, and I have seen you do it. Mm -hmm. They need to be aware of um, uh, the issues that can crop up with, uh, you know, just revealing too much information, as was said earlier. Mm -hmm. They need to uh, also recognize the problems that can be brought forth by, you know, uh, not only revealing too much, but, you know, uh, as she said, there's some information that needs to be shared in order to trace a child who is missing. But, you know, uh, can we look at, I've shared the photo, I've shared where they live, I've shared where they school, I've shared this and that. What happens to the child mm -hmm. thereafter? Mm -hmm. Okay, fine, they've been found. But when they come home, and they're going to interact with uh, the rest of the children. Uh, as a parent, when they come back to me, I'm the one who's going to suffer the repercussions of the trauma yeah. that they are going to face. True. So in as much as we are employing these digital systems in promoting their rights, in um, promoting their safety and well-being, we must also balance the fact that they're children mm -hmm. and they're vulnerable. Yeah. Yes, that's what I'd say. Great. I think that's something that we should not forget, that they're children and they're vulnerable. Thank you so much. Um, it's been such a fantastic session. Have you guys learned something? All right. Thank you so much. Was that uh, educative? Did you learn? Did you guys learn anything? Yeah, there yeah, is so add, 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 and finally, good, 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 good. So, as usual, we want to appreciate you for what you have done, and so I will. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Esther Biagon. I am the co director mentorship at Wakilisha. And had, I'm sure it has been very in inciting. Um, I'm going to start with. Uh, our very able moderator, Terry Mikaba. Yes. We can yeah. uh, appreciate her. Uh, followed by um, a 
Tena Morgan from uh, ICMEC. Thank you so much. Let's applaud. Thank you so much. Asante sana. Thank you. Ah, good. Good, 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 good. Thank you. I, I trust so far you guys are learning a lot, right? Yeah, yeah, very insightive. And uh, we really appreciate Wakilisha for this uh, thought and for bringing out such a beautiful, beautiful event. We are now entering the penultimate stage of uh, this day. And so permit me now to invite uh, someone from the farm of uh, Dali uh, Inam Inamda Advocates, Zeus Mito, please come. Uh, is going to give uh, uh, a small speech and then thereafter, Joy will follow. Please appreciate him as he makes his way here. Uh -huh. In our way now. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Zeus Mito. I'm a senior associate at the firm of CMS, Dali Namda Advocates. CMS is an international firm with a global presence in over 40 countries globally. Um, we've taken great interest in projects such as Wakilisha and for what they do um, in terms of their giving back as, as uh, advocates. Uh, I know uh, Wakilisha has a few advocates, um, and I was uh, called today to speak about the importance of uh, advocates uh, giving back in pro bono work. Before I get into that, and I'll take a very short time, um, uh, just to inform you that uh, CMS um, offer services in corporate and commercial law. Um, we also offer services in uh, banking, uh, services in real estate, uh, services in dispute resolution, and other. Now, um, I was thinking about uh, what I really need to talk about uh, in terms of uh, advocates and how they can impact on society. Hot from law school, I, I think, um, we come out with two agendas as advocates. The first one would be to make money from rendering services. Um, but more importantly, there's an ethical obligation on every advocate to offer services or to assist society without really having a benefit that is monetary. Very recently, a friend of mine uh, was walking into one of the supermarkets, I'll not mention the name, and they encountered a security guard assaulting what I would say is a child. Uh, we, we didn't uh, really get to know the age of the, the, the person, but they appeared to be a child. Um, they were a bit rugged in dressing, and they were being assaulted because uh, this guy thought that he was swindling or trying to get money from third parties uh, at that location. Uh, what my friend did, who is an advocate, was intervene, uh, stop the assault, dressed once and for all. Uh, that is one of the, the examples that emanate from an ethical obligation of every lawyer um, uh, what the assault uh, to give back to society. We are here because um, it's the day of the African child. Um, African children are very vulnerable uh, and can get into conflict with the law at any opportunity or at any turn of the corner. I say this because I have a perspective of, uh, for instance, the upcountry 
child and their daily interaction. The likelihood uh, for them to trespass onto a property, for instance, to pluck a fruit um, is very high. Um, in doing so, this child already has committed an offense and could actually face prosecution, resulting from what was a very innocent survival instinct reaction. So uh, such uh, issues should uh, bring to mind the need for advocates, uh, not just to offer services. And when I talk of services, I'm talking of offering very good quality services to uh, persons who are vulnerable in society and persons who cannot afford to pay a good lawyer to offer those services. So um, we as CMS have taken initiative and uh, we've decided to uh, collaborate with institutions such as uh, Wakilisha. Um, we also have the Pro Bono Institute of Kenya. Uh, we have the Strathmore Law Clinic. We've seen what you guys have done. And uh, we, we, we promise to be involved and to take part as and when we are required uh, to support either monetarily, but most importantly with our time to offer quality services um, uh, for any pro bonus um, projects that you might have. That is all, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mito, you've kept it brief, but elegant. So Asante Tech to take their time and give a contribution to this noble cause. So at this point, I want to invite Joy to come uh, for the next order of business. Appreciate her. She makes her way here. Karibu sana. Thank you, MC Wakili. Good afternoon, everyone. I just want to see if you're awake. Just forgive us for just a few minutes, like five to ten minutes. We are done, and then you can have lunch. At least there's a promise at the end. No? Yeah. <laughs> All right. So from day one. And when I say day one, I mean day one, when uh, the idea was uh, just birthed yeah, by our variable uh, CEO, Jambi. And she was looking for people to support and uh, senior lawyers to just verify, is this, is this idea a good one? Is this something that is viable? And it's really important that we recognize these people because it is because of such people that, you know, who allowed us to stand on their shoulders. That near Miss Irene Degua, is she here? Miss Irene Degua, please come. And as she comes, I'll just tell you, Irene, you have been awesome. Just, just come. You've been really awesome. We used to go to her office and say a lot of things, a lot, a lot of things. And she's one of the advocates who's really given her time to serving children in conflict with the law. She was leading us by doing it. And we learned so much from you, Irene. And we'll keep appreciating you because as long as Wakilisha is here, we'll keep saying thank you for supporting us. So this is just something small to say, Asante. We really honor you and treasure you. So we have something small. Uh, I know, I know this, this was not in the agenda to say something, but I really need to say one thing about Wakilisha. Thank you so, so very much for giving us our flowers while we're still here. I know at Strathmore what you did for us. It's a journey. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Thank you, Irene. Mind you, at that point, none of us were even advocates. So for an advocate to listen to you, it was an honor, you know? The next person we'd like to honor who's not here is none other than Dr. Jo Mbabu. Dr. Joy Mbabu is one of the um, senior lawyers as, as well. We went to visit all the way to her office, and she just said, I remember her just saying, just start. Just start. And she's not here with us today, but we really would love, love to honor her. She sent a representative, um, Joy. So I'll just give her gift to you, and uh, you'll pass it on to her. So, Joy. Dr. Joy Mbabu, we honor you from wherever you are. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Um, and now I want to honor 
special guests as well who are actually those who said that we are not only going to encourage you, we are also going to join you in this. And we have one of our advocates who's given of his time to serving us, who's taken up cases with us. Mr. Julo Okadia, please come. Please let's clap for him. This is an awesome person who has taken this brief like his own. You would think he's getting some quite the coins for it. And I mean, Julu, we can't say thank you enough. You've been there since day one. And thank you so much. And I hope the Law Society will see this. And there's a gift for you as well. Some of the advocates who are leading in our All right. Another advocate would like to honor for giving of his time, resources, his service, his professional expertise is none other than Mr. Titus Morioki. Morioki, where are you? Uh, he, he was here. Oh, yes, he's there. Please come. <laughs> One thing I'll say about Mr. Morioki is that when we even didn't have a physical address, we called him, can we use your office as the address to put? And he said yes. He believed in us. So, Morioki, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you so much. We have something for you. so much and God bless you in a very special way. Now, um, the rest that I'll mention are not here with us, but there are still people we'd like to recognize. I think you remember Miss Margaret Njihia, who was here. Miss Margaret Njihia deserves a clap. She met us in an online forum and she said, I want to train you on aspects of child psychology. She took us through a program, I think it was almost about two months, two, three months. It was a very long period, actually, of her time. She brought us her resources. She made us alive to the fact how to deal with these children psychologically. So, Miss Margaret and Jihia, we honor you in your absence, though you are here in the morning. Yes, so let's give it up for her. From Sterling Performance, yes. And then we have another lovely lady called Miss Joy Mutedia. Miss Joy Mutedia is um, the founder and CEO of Osoto Adventures. Um, those of you who know Akilisha, we are a big team. And to make a team work, you need a lot of these, a lot of team dynamics. And she has been offering, at no cost, a program that's very highly costed to just give us team building constantly. Activities that help us build our work and our synergy as a team. So Joy Mutedia from Osotwa, we thank you. I hope you're watching this from wherever you are. We have something small for you and we will give it to you after. So thank you very much. The other person that I will mention is Mr. Manene. Mr. Manene is from Kenya Prisons and he's from YCTC. Mr. Manene is just awesome. Anytime we need to talk to the children, anytime we have a concern, Mr. Manene is always there when we want to go visit. He's just made our work so much easier and um, we really thank him and his team because he doesn't do it alone. So. Mr. Manene, we also recognize you in your absence, and we will pass on something um, on your behalf. Yeah, We also would like to recognize Mr. Ashitiva um, of Ashitiva um, Advocates. I think most of you know the law firm. Mr. Ashitiva, thank you for believing in us when the idea was still budding. Yes, he bought us our first banner. Time, resources, thank you very much, Mr. Ashitiva. And we also have another advocate, Miss Minor. Miss Minor has also taken up matters. I remember when I'm stuck with something, I'd call her, how does this go? How does this work? Because she also works like Miss Ndegwa um, in the child justice system. So all these people just quickly without, uh, I promise to take a very few minutes. So I will quickly go, in, go into just recognizing all our sponsors and, um, and partners. So I'll start with our sponsors. CMS has already spoken. So thank you very much, CMS. Let's give them another round of applause. Sponsored part of the sponsors of this event. Then we have um, SFA Foundation. Um, SFA Foundation is actually, we have someone representing SFA Foundation, and we will give you a second just after this. Let me just finish reading. We have Child Fund. Is there anyone from Child Fund here? 
We have Chalfan. He came, he was in the panel, and he left, I think. Oh, yes, the pre-recorded message. Thank you very much, Chalfan. I mean, uh, we... Thank you, thank you, thank you. We have Green Spoon. I think if you've checked in your goodie bag, you have some Green Spoon something, something, which you can go and uh, redeem, right? So thank you very much, Green Spoon, for just being so generous. Then we have uh, Gikera and Vagama. Do we have a representative here? Gikera, Vagama, yes. Thank you so much for... Yes, yes, you're actually in the panel. Thank you so, so much for... Um, everything. Uh, so I'll give uh, 30 seconds. Okay, I'm, a minute, less than a minute to say something. Okay, uh, from SFA, and then we can move on to the vote of thanks. So, Joy, you have the floor. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm so happy to have been in this space. I'm encouraged. And um, as Sustainable Futures Africa Foundation, in short, SFA Foundation, we're actually privileged to be part of this uh, great team. And uh, the steps that they're taking really represents also our values in terms of creating that generational connect connection where we actually care for the children. And uh, I'm just so proud of every one of you, the team, those I know and those I do not know, just feel my handshake, wherever you are, like, I'm congratulating you so, so much. God bless you. And we look forward to collaborating with you, especially in your intervention, where you're promoting rehabilitative justice through mentorship and, you know, talent. Um, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, so God bless you all, and uh, enjoy the rest of your evening and week. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I mean, to our sponsors, once again, um, was really a success. And remember the very um, eloquent presentation of the CEO. I, I can't seem to read this one. Then we have Swahiba. Swahiba, anyone from there? Thank you very much. We have NCCS, who also partnered with us. Um, we have FIDA Kenya. I think I saw the representative. FIDA, yes. Thank you. We have um, Lawyers Hub, who are also great supporters. We have the NCAJ. We have International Center um, for Missing Children. Then we also have SheHacks. Um, those are the cyber, cyber security people. And then we also have, um, okay, I, I honestly can't uh, read this particular font, but thank you so, so much to everyone who supported this. And I will call Njambi, our CEO, to come and give the vote of thanks. Um. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, Joy is actually the one who birthed this, I birthed this idea. Uh, we were uh, attending a what? International Women's Day celebration. Oh, <laughs> she birthed today. She's like, you know, Jambi, why can't we do something like this? We can also do something like this, right? You're like, yeah, we can do something like this. And then we started planning it. And I think I speak for all of us when I say this event has turned out to be bigger, better than anything we could have envisioned or planned. And it is thanks to each and every one of you that is here. Whether it was advice, whether it was your time, whether it was financial commitment, just everything, communicating, just being there for us, uh, long-term partners, new partners, we thank you so, so much. Service providers, MC Wakili, the food, was the food good? <laughs> this crew has been here working. T I, don't, I don't know if they've slept, by the way. I hope you're going to sleep immediately after this. Um, I've kind of jumbled up my vote of thanks. It had a format. <laughs> but I think I'm also hungry. We need to eat. Cindy, oh. Yeah, but thank you so, so much. Uh, I, I, I need to mention one of our sponsors, Gikera and Vadgama, we had not mentioned. They have really helped us. They did the training for the children. Um, just... Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Media practitioners for coming, and maybe we, you don't, who is Wakilisha? What is that organization? We've never heard of them, but you really showed up, and we cannot thank you enough, and we hope to engage you more. Thank you to legal practitioners, judicial officers, judges, 
Justice Teresia Madeka in her absence. She's just amazing. Thank you. Uh, thank you to Baraza Media Lab for the space. Is this not a wonderful space that we are in? Yes, so thank you to the entire team. Um, and most importantly, thank you to our children for coming and the guardians who escorted them and the correctional officers who came with them. Thank you so much. If I've not mentioned you, please just know you are here. The team asked me that this is like a play. They want to thank you, all of them. <laughs> so I'll just call the Wakilisha team. We are done. We are done. This is the end. We have come to the end. We just want to, you to see the faces behind this entire um, planning committee. So those who are available, some of them are still in the training. Yes, yeah, so Joy, myself, you've met. Esther, you've met. That's ZP, head of productions, also a co-host of the Wakilisha podcast. Alex is our media liaison and also co-director of communications. Karen, you have met her on the panel. Jack is uh, our finance person. Unona Hacheki, he's just thinking all of these people, <laughs> they must eat. Yeah, so there are many others. Uh, David is in training and others that are also not represented here. Bright had to leave, but thank you guys for making this successful and for all the work you do for Wakilisha. And once again, thank you to all of you for making the time and for supporting us. And the volunteers, yes, oh gosh. <laughs> the volunteers, yes, please. If volunteers, you can also join. I don't know if... Uh, I don't know if they're around, but yeah, the volunteers have really, really, really absolutely helped us towards making this a success. Thank you so much, guys. That is it from us. Okay, so I'll hand it over to the... Hey, is it the MC to tell us uh, how we are going to proceed with the there is lunch, please, 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 please don't go. Please. If eat for two if you can. Uh, I'd like to ask you to just stop to so that we can say the final prayer. Do we have somebody who is willing to give the final prayer? It's an ambush. Anyone? Okay, I think I will pray in the absence of uh, someone to pray. Let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day. Thank you that it has been a success. Thank you that, Lord, you brought each and every person here, Lord, who's given of their time, their resources, their everything, oh Lord. We ask that you send a special blessing to each one of them. We thank you for all the groups represented here, including the children, and we pray that, God, you bless the work of Wakilish. Even as we go, we pray that you go with each one of us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Uh.